Okay, councillors, sorry for the slight delay. I declare the meeting open. I'll begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land and paying my respects to their elders, both past and present. Before I proceed with the business, can I just check with Councillor Iskander and Councillor Hesse? Can you give me a wave if you can hear me okay? Excellent. Thanks very much for that. Councillors, I have one apology this evening that I've received from Councillor Drury, um, who's unable to attend tonight's meeting. Are there any other apologies? No further apologies. Excellent. I'll move that that be accepted, seconded by Councillor Hesse. All those in favour? No, sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, Councillor, uh, Councillor Rossetti is an apology. Councillor Rossetti is an apology as well. So we'll add her apology to the um, uh, to that motion. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Hesse. All those in favour? Against? Declare that carried unanimously. The notice of webcasting for the benefit of the citizens who are registered to speak in the public forum. We uh, like to let you know at the beginning of the meeting that these proceedings are um, broadcast live on YouTube and then recorded there for posterity for our millions of fans and admirers. And we let you know about that at the beginning of the meeting so that you're aware that your comments are in the public domain and have legal ramifications. Disclosures of interest, councillors. Is there any, any disclosures of interest tonight? No disclosures? Excellent. I'll ask everyone to please join me in a moment of quiet contemplation. Thank you, councillors. We'll move on to the confirmation of the minutes of the ordinary council meeting on the 9th of February, the extraordinary meeting on the 23rd of February and the further extraordinary meeting on the 1st of March. Are there any clarifications or corrections to those minutes? No, councillor McKenna, will you move their adoption? Seconded by councillor Hesse. All those in favour, against, declare that carried. Councillors, that brings us to the public forum. Um, Mayor. Yes, Councillor Kiat. Just before we move to the public forum, um, I'd just like to move a procedural motion to allow um, a couple of residents of Yadley Avenue to speak to item 11. Um, I've emailed councillors about this. Unfortunately, they intended to register but left it until today. Um, I guess I can take the blame for that for not notifying them of the deadline. Um, but they have been waiting about a month for this item to come to council. Um, and I think it would be a shame not to hear from them. Um, Miss, uh, it's been confirmed by council officers that they, they can attend if, um, if we adopt that procedural motion. Okay. I'm sure there's no objection to that, Councillor Kiat. So I'll second your motion that, and, uh, can I just confirm that the officers are in possession of the names of those people? So if we, when we get sequentially to item 11, um, They'll be able, they'll, we don't need to. Yeah, we don't need we've to been be emailing about it. it, yes. Yeah, great. Okay. So, Councillor Kiat will move that two additional speakers be heard in the public forum on item 11. Um, I'll second that. All those in favour, against, declare that carried unanimously. So, the items on which we, for which we have registered speakers tonight are uh, items, item one, draft car share policy, item four, White's Creek Valley Park. Item five, local traffic committee. Item 10, Cut council's insurance claim processing system. Item 13, notice of motion, odour control unit in Walleye Valley. Item 15, traffic assessment around Ashfield Pool. Uh, item 16, West Connects Lilyfield Road. And item 21, Lambert Park lease negotiations update. And then we'll add to that item 11 as well, as per the, the resolution. So the first uh, item for which we have registered speakers is item one, and that speaker is Harry Bancroft of Newtown. Harry, are you there? 
I am. Um, thank you, Darcy. Um, thanks for letting me speak here today. So, uh, yeah, I'm Harry Bancroft. I'm the manager of the council space team at Go Get Car Chair. Um, yeah, so just, 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 just one moment. Sorry to interrupt, Harry. I, I was remiss not to notify you and the other speakers in the public forum that our code of meeting practice allows for three minutes per speaker. Uh, we've got a lot of registered speakers tonight, which is terrific. It's always good to have more participation. But I'm going to ask for everybody's cooperation in sticking to that three minutes so that we're able to hear from everyone as expeditiously as possible and then get on with dealing with the items that you're interested in. So over to you, Harry. No problems. I'll keep it brief. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm the manager of the council space team at Go Get Car Chair. So just speaking about the um, draft policy, car chair policy that's been put forward. Um, I'm speaking today on behalf of GoGet and our 14,000 members who are living in Inner West Council. Um, I am one of them. Um, so as some of you may know, um, as a car share service provider, GoGet really helps reduce the cost of mobility for residents and it also helps solve local parking pressures for the community. Um, we also know that it's a critical lever to help reduce CO2 emissions as it's been found that each car share vehicle will replace 10 privately owned vehicles, which frees up nine parking spaces, as well as the CO2 emissions associated with these vehicles. So all of these benefits of car share, we think are going to support key elements of the Our Inner West 2036 Community Strategic Plan. Um, so yeah, car share was first started actually in Australia in the Inner West nearly 18 years ago. Um, and today it's really well established and we do congratulate council for their commitment to grow car share through the development of the draft car share policy. Uh, we support the recommendation to place the draft policy on public exhibition for 28 days. And we're grateful to have the opportunity along with other car share operators to provide constructive feedback on the draft policy. We think that this feedback will help ensure that Inner West Council continues to be a leader with, car chair, with a car chair policy that works for members, operators, and the wider community of residents within the local government area. Um, so thank you. Thanks very much, Harry. The next item for which we have a registered speaker is item four, Whites Creek Valley Park reclassification of park area as off-leash. And that speaker is Lorna Greer of Annandale. Lorna, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yep, can hear you loud and clear. <laughs> Hi, welcome and thank you for letting me speak. It's my first time at a meeting. Um, we're fairly new to Annandale. We've been here for about eight months and I'm, um, I'm speaking on behalf or of myself and my family. And there's a group of dog walkers. I believe there's been a petition signed, which includes about a thousand people. And we're, we're, um, we're hoping that the off-leash area will be reinstated at White's Creek Valley Park. And I just wanted to say a few uh, words about why we believe that off-leash area is really great for community. And when we moved here, we were, we were surprised at the kind of small areas, but there are three areas that were off-leash and we were very welcomed and surprised by a small community of people who walked their dogs, but more than that, they gathered. And uh, through this off-leash area, we were able to meet people. I have to refer to my notes because I think I might forget things. We, um, we were able to meet people, chat. During, through these chats, we talked about the community garden, security issues, news, local community. And before we knew it, we were embraced by this huge dog walking community. And uh, there was even recently a fantastic little party where all the local dog walkers were invited to this party and every dog got a party hat and there was food. And there was about 50 people at this little party, all off leash. And uh, we just, I just wanted to say that we, we thought dogs in an off leash area, soon the local dogs get to know each other and we think it causes less fights and they, there's a community that um, happens. I've got a few notes that some other people wanted me to mention as well. Um, the idea about a non-off-leash area, I believe, creates pass-through traffic. So people often kind of walk with their dogs on a lead and they walk very quickly. They don't kind of mingle and chat and there's not the repetition of people that you meet in an off-leash area. Um, one thing that the closure of the off-leash area has caused too is a congestion of dogs. So that means there's a higher concentration 
of all different sorts of breeds of dogs in a smaller area now. And I've, we've noticed that the dog, um, the dog owners who had their little habits of walking dogs in a certain area, they now are forced into the one area or there's two areas remaining and it's caused quite a congestion of dogs. So it means that any one kind of after work period, you have 30 or 40 dogs, whereas before it was a little bit more uh, scattered. Um, we understand that there was a man on a scooter who had a complaint with um, the off-leash area. Me being a new resident, I, I would like there to be some mediation with the man, perhaps invite him to meet all the local dog community. We could have an afternoon tea or there could be mediators by the councillor members and th that man could come and meet everyone. He could bring his own dog. And I think there's been animosity be between him and other people before, perhaps we could um, work on, work on that, that relationship. Lorna, your, your time has expired. Can I ask you to conclude your remarks? Um, one last compromise, if the off-leash area can't be reinstated, we did think of either having um, off-leash area in the big open area and then on-leash where the path is, or like they do in Newtown, they often have fenced in areas. That's all. So, so I've gone over time. Thank you. Thank you. That's okay, no problem. Thank you very much. Our next registered speakers are for item five, local traffic committee meeting of February, 2021. One. The first speaker, first speaker is, just ask whoever's got their volume. Can I ask whoever's got their volume on to turn it down? Thank you. The first speaker for item five is Susan Trosdale of Roselle. Susan, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you loud and clear. Oh, thank you. Um, firstly, I'm Susan Trosdale. I live in Moody Street, Roselle. On behalf of the 45 households who signed the letter, and that's about 120 people in, in total that I represent, I'd just like to take the opportunity to thank the chair and the council for this opportunity to address them on this matter. We'd actually like the Traffic Management Committee and Council to reconsider and keep the no left turn from Moody Street into Victoria Road. For almost a year now, Moody Street has been closed at Victoria Road. So why do we ask for the no left turn at Moody Street? Firstly, Moody Street is a collector street with traffic from Darling Street using Park, Oxford, Cambridge and Waterloo streets to access Moody Street and then Victoria Road. These streets are being treated as arterial roads delivering traffic to a main road, not the residential streets they're designed to be. Secondly, the area bounded by Park, Waterloo and Moody is a residential area with many families with young children and elderly residents. The streets are narrow, there's parking on both sides and visibility is difficult. Cars traveling down the street need to be very aware of the potential for children to come out, which residents are acutely aware of and drive accordingly. Council already has traffic calming devices in these streets, indicating that cars do not travel, travel slowly enough down them. The more cars who divert down these streets, the higher the likelihood of a significant incident or a fatality. Traffic heading north along Darling Street is congested every day of the week. On the weekends and peak hours, it's even worse. Cars back up past Park Street and go back as far as Callum Park, even almost to extending to Orange Grove on the weekends. Drivers looking at the congestion look to see for a left turn off Darling so they can get to Victoria Road, and they do this via Park, Oxford, Cambridge or Waterloo Streets, all funnelling to Moody Street to get to Victoria Road. Given that the Balmain Leaves Club will soon become a spoil disposal site for the Western Harbour Tunnel and tracks will enter and leave via Victoria Road, the congestion along Darling Street is likely to get worse, making the residential streets even more attractive. So on behalf of the 45 residents, we ask Council just to reconsider leave the no left turn from Moody Street into Victoria Road in place until the West Connects is completed and that the council has undertaken a traffic assessment of traffic along North Darling, along traveling north along Darling Street and you've undertaken a local area traffic management study. The residents actually consider this to be a significant safety issue. It's an accident waiting to happen if the rat running in these congested residential streets is allowed to recommence and these streets are again treated as arterial roads rather than residential streets. 
Thank you. Thank, thanks very much, Susan. And on behalf of uh, all of the councillors, can I say I'm very sorry for the terrible living conditions that have been imposed on you in recent years due to the construction taking place around your home and all of the others in the precinct. Our next speaker uh, for the Traffic Committee minutes is John O'Brien of Stanmore. John, are you there? John, are you there? Yes, you know, I am indeed. Yes, he's yes, on yes, my, yes, he, he's sharing my computer, Darcy. This is Councillor Steer. Oh, I got no problem. I think John needs to hold the limelight a little bit more all the way. There we are. Well, I've put it on, so. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mayor and members of the Council. I refer to the decision of the Traffic Committee to remove the disabled parking space outside of 11 Bruce Street, Stanmore. I live just adjacent to that. I'm 75. I live alone. I have no siblings and no children. They I rely on friends to support me. Life advocating. I spent most of my life advocating for other people. Uh, it is a bit difficult to be now advocating for myself. I am seriously disabled with a considerable number of disabilities. Arthritis, which I've had for 20 years, uh, chronic pulmonary disease, um, heart failure, chronic skin cancer, and a whole range of other maladies. You might ask why skin cancer affects my mobility. Well, I have operations almost every year, and in recent years, I have radiation therapy, and that has the cumulative effect of slowing one down. In 2020, February, I had a car accident and the car was destroyed. In, and I decided not to drive again for my own safety and indeed for the safety of others. Uh, in March, I had some falls and finished up in Royal Prince Alfred Hospital in the geriatric ward, which is an experience in itself. But one of the positive results of that is that I received aged care support including transport. In 2021, uh, in January, I was admitted to hospital with blood clots on both lungs. This disease is often fatal. Um, treatment requires at least one blood test a week. The major effect of this and the other maladies is is I okay yeah, John, John John we're not able to hear you at the moment what I'm going to do is we have had a bit of difficulty hearing you throughout your um, contribution so far I'm going to move on to to item 10 and I'm going to come back directly to you and Bray. So that, so that we can hear from you. But I would ask that you, you try to do something about improving the reception there because otherwise it's going to be difficult to hear your contribution. So I'll move on to item 10, re return to item five in a moment. Item 10, Council's Insurance Claim Processing System. The, spe the registered speaker for that item is Colin Stokes of Camperdown. Colin, are you there? I am, Dusk. Can everyone hear me? Can hear you loud and clear. Thanks, Mr. Mayor and councillors. I'm going to read, so I won't be addressing the camera very directly. Um, my name's Colin Stokes. I live in Australia Street in Camperdown. My interest in this issue is that one of the parking signs owned by council rusted out of the base and then on a stormy night fell onto my car, causing dan damage to the, to the bonnet. The council never argued the fact that the sign's damaged to my car, of course. My experience of the council's claim process and the decision to refuse any liability came to me, though, as a surprise. I'd imagine taking responsibility for damage caused by the failure of an asset would be uncontroversial, honestly. 
As it turned out, the council outsourced the decision to the assessor, I believe that's Echelon, and as there had not been any complaint about the state of the rust of outside, council wasn't considered liable, would refuse any compensation. I hope I don't have to point out the absurdity, though, of anyone observing and reporting something that largely happens underground where the fire happened where the rust happened. I also want to point out that the parking system generates its own income. I think that system should pay for any damages it causes as a matter of natural justice. I can assure you there's plenty of parking fines generated in my street. Um, as I noted at the time, council could easily have saved me considerable time and effort by simply telling me that these sort of claims are never honoured when I rang up to report the damage to the sign. My first act was to do that as a, as a good community member. Reading the tabled report, I've got a couple of questions that remain unanswered and they're quite dense, so um, uh, I hope you'll follow along. If the report's correct and council makes the final determination on the recommendation of the outsource company, what group or individual in council makes that final determination? This wasn't at all clear in my communications with Echelon or Council. If the Council makes that final decision, why was the Echelon representative the one to tell me about it? And why did he refuse to put me in contact with the rep? Further, how is it that there's no appeals process for these decisions? More broadly, is Council only responsible for, for reported asset or failure? Isn't that a formula for kind of willful ignorance where by Council's rewarded for not knowing about damage or failure? Does council ever go against the recommended refusal? When's the moment when that happens? And when would council standing and reputation, as it says in the, uh, in the report, become actionable? How does that happen? Was the benchmarking against other councils using the same company to assess those claims? Most councils, I imagine, would use a, that company or a similar company. Equity should not be a function of every resident in every LGA getting a bad deal. And if outsourced uh, assessment is a feature of council's insurance policy, and I could well imagine that was the case, shouldn't that also be in the report? So I thought in preparation for speaking, I should have a look at the council's own values and see how that might support a change to the policy. I didn't have to delve far. The council's guiding statement to work together in a way that's creative, caring and just. Rather than simply accepting and noting the report as, as was recommended, I also recommend that you reflect on whether you think the current arrangements are just. And if you think they may not be, to change council's approach. So thanks for your time. Thanks, thanks very much, Colin. I'll now attempt to go back to Mr. O'Brien of Stanmore, who's with Councillor Steer in regards to who's speaking on item five. Mr. O'Brien, are you there? Can you hear me? Yeah, is that you, Councillor Steer? Can, can you hear you, him? Steer? I'm here. Okay. Please proceed. Mr. O'Brien, I'm going to give you another three minutes, but I'll ask you to address the substance of the, of the, um, of the report um, and I'll express my sympathy with the um, array of health difficulties that you outlined yes. so we understand that context. Can you hear me? No, we can't hear you. The reception is very poor. Okay, I'm going to keep moving on to item 13 and I will attempt to come back to Mr O'Brien um, momentarily as well. Item 13, Notice of Motion, Odor Control Unit in Walleye Valley. The one registered speaker is Peter Stevens of Bexley North. Are you there, Peter? I am indeed. Please proceed. Okay, look, I think the issue here has been very well summarised in Councillor Porsche's uh, background to the motion, and that doesn't need a lot of going into. I just want to stress to everybody that this is a regionally significant piece of bushland. It's the last by County Bankstown, Bayside and Inner West. And uh, it's very precious as a result. It's this uh, diminishing amounts of uh, natural bushland around in the area altogether. The uh, regional park is being fought for since the late 1970s. And most of that time, the Walleye Creek Regional Park, of which I'm a past president, has been very uh, active in leading the community to ensure its survival. It is now at a point where it's almost complete but there is a major stumbling block in the form of the action being taken by Sydney Water to install an odour control unit in a, a place that it's not necessary to install it and to do lots of damage in the process. And that's summarised well by Councillor Porteous's background. If they put it where it is now, it will prevent the completion of the regional park as originally conceived because two parts of it will now just touch at corner. So 
corner point to corner point, which is no connection at all uh, in any useful way. That's just one of the serious implications uh, of it. Sydney Water has been rejecting an alternative site that we have proposed uh, and have been totally resistant to uh, carrying that through properly in its REF, it hasn't really examined it properly. Um, and we now finding that the minister so far has been unresponsive as well. So we've taken steps to try and put some, uh, some lobbying into here. So uh, we've uh, had a public submission up for seven weeks. It's now running at six, 3,600 plus. Um, we've had local MPs, all four of them, uh, making representations to the minister and two other councils uh, of the three I mentioned that other than Nina West have already passed motions in support of reviewing that proposal, uh, proposed location. Um, I would like to finish by inviting any of the councillors who would like to, to come and visit the site uh, and see what the two alternatives look like and why we think it's a no-brainer to put it in the location that we've suggested. I'm off. I'm off. Thanks very much for that. Uh, the next item for which we have speakers is item 15, notice of motion traffic, oh sorry, I've, I've overlooked item 11, which we included because it's not in our business papers. Catherine, can I ask you to please identify for everyone in the meeting who the registered speakers are that Councillor Kiat referred to for item 11? Um, we have one, Paul Pagdini, and the other registered speaker is Mahilian. Okay, I couldn't hear the pronunciation of those names very well, but are either of you, I'll ask you to, to give the call yeah. to those speakers. Uh, yeah, Mahilan Sri Ravindaraja is here. Please uh, proceed. A, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm a resident of Yabsley Avenue, um, and uh, I, there's been a couple of really good written submissions made by the residents as a collective. Um, just for context for everyone on the call, um, there is a big development, as you must all be aware, in the Canterbury Bankstown Council area in the, the old Chubb security site on Milton Street. Um, as part of that development, uh, it was a late addition as part of the community consultation uh, that a suggestion was put. They make an access point from the development through to the WH Wagner Oval and through to our street. Now, uh, our position as a as the residents is that um, this would fundamentally change the nature of our street. We have a quiet dead end street. Um, all of us have young kids that happily play safely at the front. Um, it serves us no benefit to have an access point that connects the development to our street and onto the oval. It serves the purpose of the development. So the reason we've come today to, to speak is to request that the council um, works with Canterbury Bankstown Council to put a, uh, a meeting together to discuss alternative options. Uh, we understand the development has to go ahead, um, but we request that the development proceeds ahead without providing access to Yabsley Avenue as it would fundamentally change the character uh, of our street and uh, affect the community spirit that we currently have. With a street opening up, uh, if it was to be opened up to access point to the development, it would mean that um, we wouldn't be able to safely allow our kids to play out the front. Neighbours couldn't have neighbourhood parties as they currently do. Uh, it's all part of our submission. We've got photos and, and submissions and um, unanimously all the residents um, have concerns over the fact of what um, access would bring to the street, i.e. by way of additional parking through um, people trying to park in our quiet street to gain access to the oval um, or people parking in our street to be able to get access to uh, the uh, development themselves. And then beyond that, um, it becoming a thoroughfare if it was um, as such being uh, a thoroughfare for delivery drivers at all hours of the night uh, and food delivery drivers as well. Now, there is an access point to the development by Milton Street, which is only a couple of hundred metres around the corner, so it makes no material difference to this. Um, so just in summary, uh, what we would like to request is that Inner West Council looks after its interests. Um, it looks after the residents who live in the Inner West Council on the Absley Avenue uh, and supports us by facilitating a meeting between Canterbury Council's uh, designated 
officers and NOS councils to discuss alternatives in terms of um, what would work best for the proposed development as well as what would work best for residents. Thank you. And I believe I can see Paul on the line as well. Okay, terrific. Thanks for that introduction. Paul, are you there? Yes, I am. Over to you. Sure, thank you. Uh, yes, I just wanted to give um, my face to the um, motion proposed by Councillor Keat. Um, I've been living at this street for six years and it is um, an unusual street in that it is effectively a cul-de-sac with a fence at the end of Yabsley Avenue. It's only a very short street. Um, at the um, fence is effectively the junction between the two councils. Uh, it's the administrative border between um, Canterbury Council and uh, the Inner West Council and previously Ashu Council. And so um, that's the border for the development. Now the development, uh, there's a currently a fence there and the development proposes to build a fence there as well. Um, but they want to put an access point uh, in that fence so that people can make their way to the development from Yabsley Avenue. And so effectively what they're trying to do is um, create a, a solution to some of their traffic problems and parking problems by dumping it on uh, Ashfield or Inner West Council uh, via our particular street. Um, not only that, um, what it's uh, proposing to do is increase the amenity of the residents of the new development at the cost of the amenity of the existing uh, residents of um, Yabsley Avenue. And so this is effectively a, a cost for Inner West Council and its residents. Uh, and it's something that um, shouldn't occur because it, uh, the traffic and parking is an issue that, for the development and the appropriate um, uh, council, which is uh, Canterbury Council. And so uh, the, the other issue for me is that uh, it will fundamentally change the character. It will increase um, traffic. Uh, it will increase parking, which will make uh, it difficult for residents. It will change the way that we raise our children. We've got a lot of young children on that street. These children ride their bikes on the street available to us because of the increased and the things that aspect of the development. Um, it was, uh, to be honest, uh, and a, a final addition or, or a late addition to the plan by um, the Canterbury Council. And uh, it was a development, uh, sorry, it was an addition that was made after residents input. Uh, and so we weren't able to respond to it. Um, and so this is kind of our opportunity. We've made a submission to Canterbury Council to the development application um, since that time. Um, but we would prefer for it to be dealt with before um, it goes any further. And uh, the idea here is that um, we're able to meet with the Canterbury Council on site and demonstrate how this um, particular feature of the development will affect us and how it's not uh, essential to the um, viability of the project. Uh, we support the project in uh, per se, that is the um, development. Uh, it's just this access point, which is unnecessary and will cost us in terms of our amenity. Thank you. Thanks very much. Just before I go back to the rest of the registered speakers, Catherine, we seem to be having an unusual frequency of problems with reception tonight. Can I just ask you to clarify whether there's any particular problem at our end or it just it happened, it's happenstance that, uh, that we've had a number of people with um, reception problems at their end? Yes, the Mayor, everything looks good on our end, so it could be the residents. Okay, no problem. Thanks very much. That brings us to item um, 15, notice of motion, traffic um, assessment around Ashfield Pool. Chang Chan of Croydon, are you there? Yep. Hi, thanks for letting me speak. Um, so I have a few, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay. So I had a few points to raise about the traffic conditions around Ashfield Aquatic Centre. So the first point being the parking from early morning till 8 p.m. when the pool closes. Um, we've seen that swimming pool staff and patrons are all constantly using the street parking on Bastopal and Etrovinville parade to avoid the two hour limit um, on those car parks. Um, and this increased volume of parked cars on these narrow streets have made it more difficult for residents to try to enter and exit from their driveways. Um, the second point is the on the eastern side car park exit um, with the right turn onto Elizabeth Street. So this has been an existing issue prior to the construction of the new aquatic center. 
Um, so due to the short distance to the traffic light at Elizabeth Street and Frederick Street, it causes a hazardous situation. Um, and often we can see uh, cars blocking off traffic when they're trying to exit from the car park. So because of this difficult right turn, most people would choose to do a left turn instead, and this would lead to the next point. So Bastable Street itself is a no-through road, yet we constantly see people using the street as a U-turn point. So a few weeks ago, one of our neighbor's cars was damaged due to someone doing a U-turn. And a few years ago, someone actually drove their car into our garage door uh, when they were attempting to do a U-turn into our driveway. So given the number of cars parked on the street and how narrow the street is, it's not too surprising to find that this situation can happen and it may happen again. So the last observation is that a lot of swimming pool patrons are constantly using the new exit, which is on the western side of the car park as an entrance. So despite there being signs saying that there is no entrance there. Um, so what we'll find is that in the morning, a lot of people would enter into Bastable Street and they'll try to look for street parking. And given that most of the car park spots are unavailable, then they'll try to use that exit to enter into the car park and park there instead. So during the construction of the pool, due to the parking issues which we've had already with construction work going on, uh, we contacted uh, council workers who um, assessed the situation and they told us to put parking lines um, outside our house to um, try to help, but this would not help. Um, and then we were informed that there will be a further study which will be conducted after the opening of the swimming pool. And so far I've tried to reach back out to that person, but I haven't heard back so far. So some of these issues, they've already existed before the construction of the pool. So we just wanted to find out how council would be further addressing these problems. Thank you. Th thank you very much for your contribution, um, which was very good and succinct. The next item for which there's a speaker is item 16, West Connects, Lilyfield Road, and that speaker is David Murant of Murant of Lilyfield. David, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Can hear you very well. Excellent. Thanks for letting me speak. Um, I'm a resident of Lilyfield Road, and we have for a number of years put up with rat running through Lilyfield Road, a number of issues, including uh, speeding, crossing the wrong side of the road, um, but one of the main issues that I want to talk about is the Eastern Park interface and how it interfaces with West Connects. So through a working group meeting with West Connects and their contractor, John Holland Group, um, we have raised concerns that you've got Eastern Park on one side, the new railway lines on the other side with a park, both with children's play areas, both with sporting fields, and there'll be an increase in people crossing Lilyfield Road, where you've got um, poor sighting distance on Lilyfield Road and high-speed high vehicles. Um, in discussions with Transport for New South Wales, um, the scope of works for John Holland is at the moment on the, the south side of Lilyfield Road. However, Transport for New South Wales said that they would consider moving that line for the scope of the project to the northern side of Lilyfield Road through that section which would enable some continuity between the parklands and for the safety to be addressed as part of the project. So that when West Connects finishes, um, we're safe to use that park and cross between the two parks. Um, the one caveat they've said is that they need council to come on board with that um, to get them to change the scope of works for John Holland. Otherwise we will go through a process of West Connects finishing West Connects, John Holland will reconstruct Lilyfield Road back to its original condition, which was not suitable. Um, and then council will come along, dig up Lilyfield Road and make changes. Um, we are sick of all of construction works. We don't want it to go on longer. Um, we would like council to, to work with Transport for New South Wales to get this done and have that continuity and safety from day dot when that park is complete. Thank you. Thanks very much, David. And, and sorry for me going just a little bit outside of normal process here, but you've obviously got better communications channels with West Connects and the government than we do because Andrew Constance hasn't responded to any of our letters in the past year and we never hear anything from him. So can I just get clarification as to how you've received this information from 
West Connects uh, from the government and where we could access it so we could progress the matter? Um, yeah, I'm happy to. We had a working group meeting with the residents of Lilyfield Road, which was organised by the contractor being uh, John Holland and Transport yeah. for New South Wales. So their communications manager, their principal communications manager, is the one who um, put that out there as a as a, an option. Um, but yeah, they just said we need council. I am more than happy to try and get them along. Um, I've been dealing with uh, Lynn Matchin as well um, to try and get council and transport working together or talking. Um, that's what I'm trying to achieve yeah. because... Well, it, it, certainly, thank you very much for that. If you could forward that correspondence you've received to all councillors, if you can do it tonight, then we'll be um, fully informed when we consider the motion a little later on. It's not for a lack of effort from council's end. We've been trying to have conversations with the government about all of these impacts for a very long period of time with far too little responsiveness to us or to the community. So. The, the email addresses for councillors are up on the website. If you're able to flick that through tonight, that'd be very helpful. All right. We don't have, I don't have a written communication from them. This is part of a, a meeting that's oh, not right. minuted. So oh, okay. Um, okay. No, I can certainly send through details of, of the contacts that, that spoke to them or I can ask for them to send something in writing. No, sorry. All good. I didn't understand. No problem. We'll, we'll, um, we'll consider that when we deal with the motion. Thanks very much. All right. Cheers. Uh, the last item for which we have registered speakers is item 21, Lambert Park Lease Negotiations Update. The first speaker is Franco Parisi of Chiswick. Franco, are you there? Does it look clear up? Yes. yes. Ask if I can, can you hear me? Um, we can, but not very well. You might be better to try and go somewhere a little bit quieter. Yeah, I'm walking away. Is it getting better now? Yes. Okay. okay. Thanks, guys. Probably just just here on the training ground. Okay. Can you hear me loud and clear now? Can hear you very clearly now. Yes. Okay. My name is Franco Parisi. I am currently the club captain for the Arpia Men's NPL Club and have been involved with Arpia since 1990. I am Leichhardt born and bred and my family has been in Leichhardt for over 60 years with most of us being local business owners. 2014 was a big year for Arpia. It was the year when the club, together with the state government, invested a significant amount of money to improve the facility and in particular to install a FIFA state-of-the-art synthetic field. This included the creation of the dressing rooms specific for both our women's and men's program. How many others can say that? The park is now the pride and joy of the footballing community of the inner west. It is the pinnacle for players in our area and on the weekends it is full of either clubs in the NPL men's or women's program, grassroots club and our own football programs for toddlers and kids. As you may know, the NPL preseason and season runs for about 48 weeks of the year. So I do spend a lot of time here at Lambert Park. We typically have two weeks off in late September when the season ends and then a two week break over the Christmas for obvious reasons. Other than that, both NPL programs are going full steam ahead at this venue, Lambert Park. The facility and park certainly do get a workout. To see Lambert Park in such a good condition seems so normal these days. But that was not always the case. And I remember in the pre-synthetic field days of Lambert being a dust bowl. It was only following the renovations in 2014 that our NPL programs really started to grow. And now we are one of three clubs to have both men's and women's in the NPL, which is the highest league in the Australian leagues outside of the A-League and W-League. Our programs alone have grown to maximum proportions not only do we have successful senior team, but our youth boys and girls are now considered the strongest in all of the state of New South Wales. The ground has stood the test of time and eight years on, it is still pristine FIFA approved condition. Only a few weeks ago, the club invested over $100,000 in having the field rejuvenated for the upcoming season. It is groomed on a fortnightly basis. It is well maintained and there is no wonder it is the envy of the NPL program. 
the club every year spends significant monies in maintaining the grounds. A lot of this is undertaken through sponsorship by one of the 80 local businesses that support our club or through other revenue raising activities by a large group of local community members. You will also notice the club has installed a brand new roof in the off season. It looks great and feels much better sitting under the new roof than the old roof during the summer. The club has also finally taken the step of building a team's gymnasium and treatment studio. We used the part of the clubhouse that was not being used, certainly making use of limited space. A guy was needed as it helps all the club's players, old and young, to do their workouts, their prehab and rehab all in the one location. Having such facilities really helps Arpia maintain its status as a leading men and women's NPL program in the state of New South Wales. The club has also redone all the ground lighting within the venue. This includes significant recabling and a mass of 40 globes and ballastics Ballastic updated. updated. Franco, your time's expired. I'm going to move an extension of time of two minutes, seconded by Councillor Lockie. All those in favour, against, declare that carried. Please proceed. Thank you. That'll be a sufficient time. The park now meets the luxurious threshold required by Fox Sports to have a game on live TV. We have also fitted the clubhouse and change rooms with LED lighting. We have also renovated the clubhouse. It was quite tired and worn. This included replacing the clubhouse glass that overlooks the field. It is now toughened glass, suitable for games. The usage is twofold. On game day, it is a place for fans. During the week, it is used for different arms of the club to convene, run video sessions, relax, and talk football. To meet the criteria set by Football New South Wales to play in this league, we have improved our grass warm-up areas and installed a media box from which um, men's and women's matches are live streamed. We take great pride in calling Lambert Park our home. It has something about it. It is our home for the past 60 plus years. In closing, I look forward to seeing the continued growth of Arpia and the next generation of footballers developing at Lambert Park. Everyone in the inner west knows who Arpia are and what the club has done for our community. We are the community. Thank you. Thanks very much, Franco. Absolutely. Our, our next registered speaker on this item is Ashley Palombi of Queenscliff. Ashley, are you there? Ashley, are you with us? Yep, yeah, sorry, can you hear me there? Yep, can hear you well. Can you hear me there? Yes, we can hear you. Um, thank you very much for having me. My name is Ashley Palombi and I am the club captain for the RPA Life Art Women's MPL side. Um, it's with great pride that I say that because we are the only Inner West NPL One um, club and NPL One, as Franco regarded as the absolute competition in New South Wales for football, but more importantly, um, it, it would definitely be competitive as one of the most um, prestigious competitions in Australia for football. For the women's side of things, it wasn't all smooth sailing for us. We, about six, seven years ago, were in the third division and we've worked really, really hard in line with having Lambert Park and its rejuvenation um, to build, move our way through the divisions and up into MPL1. This is no small feat for a club like Arpia. Um, we believe that we punch well above our weight as the only way to raise funds for our club is through our army of volunteers seeking sponsorship and going through um, volunteer avenues as opposed to having a, a club that we're, we are associated with to, to raise funds that way. We support the Inner West community by registering 200 juniors from in and around, uh, from in and around the Inner West, but we could easily have more than this number um, if Football New South Wales allowed it, as we have over 700 trialists at, a, at our trials each year. The reason why I personally love the club is because of the culture that's established, the family-centered focus that we have there, and our inclusiveness of people from all races, religions, socioeconomic backgrounds. We work really hard to make sure that there is an equal opportunity provided for everyone. We provide free registration for disadvantaged children, and we provide local clinics for the community that aren't registered as part of our club so that they have access to the high level and coaching staff facilities, including Lambert Park, that all of us do. 
For me, I think Lambert Park and RPA Leichhardt Football Club are synonymous. I couldn't imagine going on the journey any further without having Lambert Park as our home ground. Our goal is to be the best football club in Australia and I couldn't imagine Lambert Park not being the home of that. So before I pass on to George, I think it would be yeah remiss of us not to make that that was the way that the future was set out. Thanks. Thank you very much for that. And our last registered speaker is Georgia Yeomandale of Kirribilli. Georgia, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? I can hear you very well. Excellent. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak. I hope that I can add something a little bit different to both Frank and Ash. Uh, so I am a current player of the Arpia Leichhardt uh, senior women's side. I'm also a current player at uh, the Western Sydney Wanderers in the W League and part of the Matildas squad. I'm also a commentator at Fox Sports, so I have a lot to do with uh, football in Australia. I've had a lot of experience of different clubs uh, in both New South Wales and ACT, and none have had the same feeling of inclusiveness and fa family as Arpia. I moved to Arpia at the start of the 2020 season because I needed a quality train envir training environment between W League seasons. RP is able to provide a quality uh, training environment through both the high standard of players that it's able to attract and the top quality training facility it provides. We train at Lambert Park three times a week and play all our home games there. Having a, club, uh, having a training environment uh, in the inner west also allows me to maintain my full-time job that I do outside of football. The facilities that RPA, provide, that RPA provides at Lambert are second to none in the New South Wales Premier League for women. We have our own change rooms, female only, and gym facilities, ensuring that Lambert Park really feels like home. RPA has been able to attract many top Australian players from the W League, which in turn attracts many juniors to our SAP program and junior teams. These programs are run with the utmost professionalism and inclusiveness for all, regardless of race, religion, and sexual orientation. I am confident that with the current trajectory of the club, that Arpia and in turn, the Inner West will produce future stars of the game. However, a key element of being able to maintain this trajectory and retain players lays reliant on being able to provide the best training facilities, which is why it's important for myself and the club that we are able to continue calling Lambert Park home. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, I think that concludes. Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to try one more time to go back to the gentleman who is in attendance with Councillor Steer. Um, do want to hear from him. Yeah. So please. Yeah, are you there, Councillor Steer? I am here. Uh, Darcy, I've only got two bars on the iPad. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch off the video and uh, let John speak to improve the audio. Okay. So. Um, I refer to uh, disabled parking space outside Bruce Street, Stanmore, which was recently removed. I outlined my many disabilities in the last attempt. The result of this is I had many medical appointments. And it's obviously easier for me to have the car parking that picks me up to take these appointments parked in a space outside my home. Indeed, to walk more than a few metres, uh, it, it has become very difficult to me, for me, and particularly in relation to breathlessness. That, and my arthritis, uh, limits my mobility considerably. So I have two requests. The decision about the parking space at 11 Bruce Street, Stanmore, be reviewed. And much more importantly, perhaps the council could consider having a general review of aged care services provided by the Inner West Council. 
Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much for that. I think that concludes the, um, the public forum, which will bring us next to condolence motions, of which I have tabled two with the, with the minute takers tonight. And I'll ask them, uh, and one is in relation to a prominent citizen of the former Marrickville local government area, and the second is in relation to uh, a prominent citizen of the former Ashfield local government area. So I, I will invite councillors representing those um, local communities to move the motion and withdraw my name. The first is in relation to the passing of Carl Hines Fusting. Councillor, would I be appreciative of speaking to that if I could or moving it? Please do, Councillor Hesse. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> and look, I, I'm sure this, I know I notified the general manager of this issue, but I'm sure the general manager is very busy with many things. But thank you, uh, Mayor, for putting it on the agenda. I really appreciate it, as I'm sure his family do. Uh, Carl, as he was known, Carl Fusting was the president of the Concordia Club for, I think, the last dozen or so years and died suddenly um, in February. Uh, he just died suddenly. He was 81 years of age. Carl's significant contribution to the Marrickville Local Government Area was the club. Um, I think there's no doubt that the attraction for people in South Marrickville and Tempe in particular was that this was a place where people could come together with their children and enjoy traditional fair, I suppose, club fair in a convivial and safe place. And that was a joy of Carl, I think, to bring people together in that way. Carl got rid of poker machines many, many years ago. Um, and I think that was also an important thing for him because he really believed in bringing people together and bringing families together in that safe place. The Concordia Club, of course, is essentially a volunteer run outfit with some paid staff. But that was Carl's... And Carl was like working very, very hard, of course, to make sure that the club could be transitioned beyond its... German roots, which go back to the 19th century. I think it's, I think it's was clear that the Concordia Club is the oldest, if not one of the oldest, registered clubs in Australian history. It has a very long and proud history of community service. I think Carl's story has also a lot to do with the migrant experience of the post-war era. Carl was born in 1939 and migrated to Australia after doing his engineering training at the beginning of the 60s. And he told me a lovely story how on the boat out, he'd um, paddled up with some Italian people um, coming out to join family. He spoke Italian because that's where the, the family holidayed in summertime. And he hadn't quite realised that Australians didn't speak, in, didn't speak German. <laughs> and he told the story of, of getting off the boat at Circular Quay, sort of trudging along with his suitcase, thinking, what am I going to do? And being called out to by one of his Italian friends from the boat, um, who then offered him um, a, a place in their home in Leichhardt um, and then said, well, how's your English? And he said, not much. And he, well, he got a job um, at a television factory down at Miranda the next day and eventually went off to start his own business. I think that that tells us a lot about a time which has passed in Australia, but it tells us a lovely story about Australia too, that someone could literally get off the boat knowing no one with no connections the, the warmth of the Italian community in Leichhardt of, 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 toward a fellow migrant and the opportunity that Australia presented to Carl and his family, um, his wife um, as well, and their, and their daughters, who are terrific people in their own right. And to be able to contribute, I think the, the Concordia Club was, was very, very much a way for Carl to, to give back to his adopted country. And I say with a heavy heart that he will be deeply missed, as he is deeply missed, going to the club now is a, is a strange thing without Carl. But it's also a tribute to him and the community he's been part of. And that indeed will linger for many years and in fact, I, I hope will grow in his memory. And I, so I think, I think councillors are going for listening and I thank the mayor for putting this condolence motion up. And I think most of all, his family and his wife, Marja, in particular, for sharing Carl with all of us in the Marrickville and Tempe community, in particular, of course, beyond. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor Hesse. Are there any other councillors who wish to speak to the motion? 
I'll say a couple of words, Chair. Thank you. Yes, Councillor Macri. <clears throat> yeah, I, I first met Carl uh, when I first got elected to council and um, Morris Hanna was the mayor at the time and he asked me to fill in to represent him at an event down there at the Concordia Club. Carl went out of his way to make me feel welcome in the club and then we had many conversations over the years and we laughed and joked about the good old days when the Concordia Club was on Stanmore Road and it was a bit of a different club than what eventuated down there just at Mackey Park. And it was always his dream to involve families, so much so that he was tirelessly working, trying to work with the other groups around him to make sure children had places to run and play. And that was one of the things that absorbed him during the later years of his life, making sure that the legacy was there for the club. And a lot of people don't realise this, but the first migrants, early migrants to Maryville came after World War I and the large numbers were actually Germans and Italians. So the German community is part of us, like the many different peoples that come through Maryville we're all very proud and, and welcome, all of them in the inner west. And it's good to see, hopefully, that will never change. And I'll just say thank you to Carl and his family for all the wonderful times, and I hope the Concordia Club goes on and on and on. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Macri. Is there any further discussion? If not, I'll list Councillor Macri as the seconder for the motion. I'll put that, all those in favour, against, declare that carried unanimously. Can I ask the minute taker please to scroll down to the second condolence motion, which will be moved by Councillor McKenna. Councillor McKenna, do you wish to speak to the motion? Sorry, Councillor McKenna, we can't hear you. You need to unmute, Lucille. There I am. Sorry about that. Um, anybody that's had anything to do with tennis in the inner west um, probably knows James Leggett. He's quite an institution. He's a man that's played uh, badge tennis um, for I think it's 50, more than 50 years. Um, just prior to um, his death, he was still playing um, competition tennis. He's played with... Um, I believe um, uh, the, you know, the Western Suburbs uh, Tennis Club and uh, for some time, I believe in Marrickville, I think it's in the notes there. I can't see any of them. So, um, it, but he is an absolute institution and he'll be sadly missed in that tennis community. And of course, with his family, um, I've only really got to know him in recent years um, when he rejoined um, the Western Suburbs Tennis Club in Ashfield. So, um, with great sadness that, um, that that I speak to this condolence motion and my best wishes to, to his family. Thanks very much, Councillor McKenna. I'm happy to second the motion. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak to it? If not, I'll put that motion. All those in favour? All those against? I declare that carried unanimously. That brings us to the mayoral minutes this evening, councillors. Count, uh, Catherine, can I ask you to please to... Bring those up on the screen. Thank you for that. Councillors, the first mayoral minute is in relation to the gazettal of the extended trading hours and cultural Excuse activities planning Excuse proposal me. that yeah. Council has submitted yeah. to the New South Excuse Wales me. Government. Sorry, Councillor yeah. Cassius, I'm just speaking. I'll ask you to desist from interjecting. Just raise uh, an issue. So Sorry, Councillor Passus, I've already begun speaking to the motion. I'll ask you to desist from interjecting. I'll have to warn you. I, um, uh, I uh, as councillors will all be aware, we adopted this policy in October. It's been submitted to the New South Wales government last year. And uh, we're, we've been unable to get a clear answer from them as to when the policy will be gazetted or when we'll receive a response. Um, and uh, whilst I'm sure the planning minister, Rob Stokes, along with ministers such, a, such as Victor Dominello, they're all on the record saying that they want to support the rejuvenation of the arts economy and the hospitality sector. 
um, well, this is a, a groundbreaking policy that will help to do that in the inner west and can have the same impact across Sydney by doing away with the need for a development application to undertake cultural, um, artistic events and live music within industrial premises, as well as Main Street properties uh, for up to an audience of up to 150 people in industrial premises and, and 80 people in, in local centre zones, will mean that there's a plethora of new, new venues that become available for local artists to rehearse, perform and exhibit their work in. And uh, we all know that the arts and music sectors have been on life support throughout the pandemic. It's been very sad to see the lack of support that's been provided uh, to those sectors in particular. This is a, a common sense planning proposal that requires no government expenditure, just requires the planning minister to, um, to sign, sign off on the gazetteal. And then we can undertake this groundbreaking policy in the inner west. I'm sure it'll be taken up in other places as well. So I'm proposing that we, um, I have actually contacted the minister's office and as, with, as has been the case with most of the representations that we make to the New South Wales government, I've received no, no information in reply as to when the, the matter will be dealt with. And so I'm proposing that we write off to the planning minister just to express with absolute clarity the urgency of this proposal and to ask Mr Stokes, Minister Stokes to be the, the white knight, if you like, who will step in and uh, sign off on this proposal so that we can do something practical to improve the living conditions of local artists and to get the arts and music scene back up on its feet. So I, I will move that way. Councillors, is there any discussion? Yes, <coughs> Hello. I'm happy to second. Councillor York, do you wish to speak to the item? Oh, only just to note that um, it, it's fantastic that we've made it to this point. Councillors will recall that I've moved several times the progression of this through various stages, this proposition, and um, to stumble at the last hurdle if we can't get uh, you know, adequate attention from the planning minister would be more than a shame. Um, and, you know, the reason why... As council, we've adopted this uh, approach um, each time we've discussed it is because we're all aware that for our arts and creative communities, the number one constraint prior to COVID to um, their continued thriving in the inner west has been access to venues. And I think we've heard that message loud and clear over and over again, venues, venues, venues. And um, that's been exacerbated in no small part by the experience of the last 12 months with COVID. So, um, yeah, fully endorse and support. Thank you for that. Councillor York will second the motion. Is there any further discussion? No, just yes, I have a question, Councillor Steer. Councillor Steer, yes. Yes, and my question is this. Um, what is the is there anything to actually be gazetted yet? Has the gateway determination been made and do we know what it is? Uh, because if we can't get it gazetted, what's the point of this motion? I'm not sure what I'm not sure I understand your question if it's posed to me, Councillor. Uh, point two, point two is requesting the urgent gazette of the gateway determination of the extended yeah. trading yeah. hours and cultural activities planning proposal. Has yeah. that gateway determination actually been made? No, there's been no there's been no response from the government at all to the planning proposal that we've lodged with them. So how can we ask for something to be gazetted if it hasn't been done yet? I think we're getting into semantics. We've got a, a planning proposal that we've submitted with the government. It does need to go through Gateway. It does need to be gazetted. They've done neither. And so the motion is seeking their urgent attention to progress the policy. Mr Mayor? Can I yes, ask a question? I've got my hand up as well, uh, Councillor Byrne. Yes, Councillor Porteous. Okay. Councillor Stamoulis, please proceed Thank and you. then I'll go to Councillor Porteous. Uh, Mr Mayor, I, I think there's a, a useful way of um, strengthening this uh, mayoral minute, uh, in particular when you write to the planning minister expressing our um, urgency. Um, it would be good if we could get a number of those venues to be listed in this letter, as well as a number of, it doesn't have to be a comprehensive long list, but um, certainly a number of those venues say, Minister, we, we, are, we are ready and waiting to move forward. 
and we're being delayed and list down a number of venues as well as a number of um, uh, operators uh, or performers that would that would absolutely move into this space as soon as, as soon as it becomes available and that might assist in uh, promoting the urgency. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. Just for clarity, before I go to Councillor Porteous in, in addressing Councillor um, Steer's concern, perhaps it would be easier if point two were just to read rights to the planning minister requesting urgent approval of the extended trading hours and cultural activities planning proposal, which would deal with all of the issues relating to approval. So I'll ask the minute taker to amend the motion in that way. And Councillor Stamoulis, if you'd like to collate a list of artists and venues um, who are in support of the proposal and forward that to me, I'm very happy to include that in the correspondence that we uh, send through to the government. Thank you for volunteering to assist with no, the policy. Mayor, Mr Mayor, that's not the work of a councillor. You know that. That's the work of our... our, so, our sorry, sorry Councillor Stamoulis. Sorry, I, I thought you were proposing an amendment, but you hadn't provided any wording to the minute taker. But well, certainly... I'm trying to be helpful to your motion and asking when that better is I'll written. call the meeting to order. I'll call the meeting to order. You haven't proposed an amendment. You suggested that it would be... Point of order. Point of order. Sorry, Councillor Passus. I'll call you to order. I've Sorry, made Councillor a Passus. point of Sorry, order. Sorry, Councillor Passus. I'll call you to order. I'm just dealing with Councillor Stamoulis. I've I got have that. made... You must cease yeah. all other business when a Sorry. point of order... Sorry, is Councillor made. Passus. Sorry, Councillor Passus, if you could just... If you could desist for one moment... It's, it is sometimes confusing for me because you're such a frequent interjector. It's not always easy for me to deal with everybody fairly in accordance with the code of meeting practice. Councillor Stamoulis, thanks for that suggestion. I'm happy to consider any amendment that you propose. Councillor Porteous, I won't come to you as yet because Councillor Passus has moved, moved a point of order. Councillor Passus. Mayor, I would like to remind you, you have... Councillor Passus, if you could if, refer to the Code of Meeting Practice in relation to your point I'm of I'm referring order. to the Code of Meeting Practice. Please Mayor, proceed. It must be put to councillors for extension of time on speakers, and each individual councillor councillor nominates if they are second in a motion. It is not your role... Sorry, Councillor Passus. Extending, sorry, extending speaking sorry, time sorry, for Passus. second in motions. Sorry, Councillor Passus. There's been a vote on all of the... Uh, extensions of time granted to the members, uh, to the citizens participating in the public forum. There was no motion of dissent in any of those determinations. There was no, not I'll move on to voting. Sorry, Councillor Passus, I'll ask you to stop interjecting. Councillor Porteous, you have the floor. Uh, thanks, Councillor Byrne. Uh, look, I'm, I'm pleased that you have amended number two because I was concerned about us asking for the gazettal of a determination which we hadn't had, I think that would have been problematic. We first need to know whether or not there is going to be approval uh, of the extended training hours and cultural activities before we then move on to ask for it to be gazetted. So I think that's clarified things a bit more. Uh, with point three, um, obviously we, we can't start promoting this policy unless it is approved. So I'd ask that you amend this uh, to read that uh, once approval has been obtained uh, from the planning minister, we then promote this policy through our council communication channels, because if we start promoting it prior to that, that's called, going to cause an awful lot of confusion for businesses uh, who are going to think that it's already approved and proceed ahead and, and get themselves into trouble. Thanks, Councillor Portis. I'll amend point three to read promotes this advocacy through all council communication channels, which I think addresses your concern. Uh, no, that doesn't address my concerns. That just makes it even uh, more oblique. Okay, think, well, I'll, I'll address your concerns in my right of reply. Further well, I, discussion, I think what you need to do is actually... Sorry, Councillor Portis, you, you've concluded your remarks. Uh, Councillors, is there any further discussion? Uh, I, I would remove an extension for Council Portis to conclude. Well, she had already concluded, so I, I, I'm, cer I'm certainly happy to uh, accept a, a motion to extend people's time, but Councillor Porteous had concluded her remarks and I'd address them and agree to amend the, 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 um, the motion. Uh, well, she didn't agree to it, but I, I, we'd already moved on. Councillor De Cruz. Yeah, ho hopefully, so I'm coming in through my phone, so I'm not sure how that'll work, but hopefully the line will line I, I can hear you very clearly. Um, um, Excellent. Um, I guess 
one thing that we're all very aware that COVID is a big thing. So I wondered if we should actually write to the minister and suggest that um, working on this approval would actually help um, cultural and venues having um, with their COVID recovery. Um, and I suppose in point three, what you're probably really suggesting is that we gauge and prepare people for when this, should this um, policy be, um, this planning proposal be approved. So perhaps combining with what Councillor Stamless had said before, this is an opportunity to, um, for people to actually register their interest in such a thing. And that would also give strength to um, our advocacy to the minister. So perhaps that's what we're looking for in point three. Um, encourage people to register their interest in in the kind of activities that they would be able to do proceed with should this approval be given. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very, very happy to consider any amendments that are submitted to the minute taker. I particularly strongly agree with Councillor de Cruz about the benefit that this policy would have for um, local artists recovering from the, the economic crisis, but I'm not able to consider any amendment that hasn't been submitted to the minute taker. Uh, further discussion, councillors? There's no further discussion. I'll make a, a very brief right of reply, or I'm happy just to wait a moment or two if councillor Stamilis or councillor de Cruz are in the process of drafting an amendment. No? Okay, no problem. Uh, well, you, you ridiculed it, Mr. Mayor. That's the problem. You know, if you want cooperation on these things, sorry, you need to be Sorry, sorry Councillor Stamilis, I'm just asking that you follow the Code of Meeting Practice and submit an amendment, which I'd be happy to consider, but that hasn't occurred. So I'll move on to the right of reply. Councillors, um, look, uh, 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 to be frank about this, Councillor York and myself have done a lot of work on this policy, done a lot of advocacy on it, along with some other councillors. Um, it's not a policy that very many councillors have done very much legwork on at all. And, and to be blunt, um, that's been a pattern throughout this term of council in which there's been a small cohort of councillors who have been putting forward lots of positive policy ideas and, and a majority of councillors who've put forward very few. So it's a, I'm a little bit unwilling to accept um, criticism of policies that have been adopted by council. Um, when other councillors are so unwilling to put forward positive policy ideas themselves. In this instance, I think it's pretty clear what the motion represents. We are seeking to draw public attention and exert advocacy and pressure on the New South Wales government to the outstanding planning proposal that our council officers have developed after a resolution of the council. I want to acknowledge again the, the excellent work that's been undertaken by the, the staff at council on the development of this policy. It's taken a little longer than I would have liked, but it's now finalised and we've adopted it. I can't remember if it was unanimous, but it was certainly overwhelmingly supported. And now the government is delaying its implementation. So it's not very complicated. We just need to undertake our role as advocates to get it implemented. And all of us have a responsibility for that. So I'll now put the motion. All those in favour, please raise your hands and keep them raised. In support, I have councillors McKenna, Stamilis, De Cruz, Hesse, Lockie, Macri, York, Steer, sorry, it may be my reception. I can't see any of the other councillors. So I can't see the screens of councillors Steer, Kiat, Porteous. Mayor, um this is Councillor Kiat. I'm in favour. Yeah, so I've got Kiat in favour. Sam Iskander in favour. Councillor Iskander is in favour. Councillor Steer is in favour. Councillor Porteous, are you in support? Councillor Porteous, are you there? Councillor Iskander is in support. Sorry, and yes, Darcy, I lost my connection for a second. Was Thank that was that the that. vote we were doing? Was it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm voting for. Yeah. And all those against? 
Councillor Passis, you've disappeared from the screen. You weren't in support. Are you against the motion or are you abstaining? Councillor Passis, are you there? Okay. I'll just seek clarification from the council officers. Councillor Passis has um, left the meeting. Does that count as an abstention or as voting against the motion? She didn't raise her hand in support previously. Through the chair, if um, the councillor is absent electronically from the meeting, it's the equivalent of leaving the chamber. So you're okay. simply absent and recorded as voting against. Okay, thank you. I can see Councillor Passis, but she obviously can't hear us because she's um, not bringing herself onto the screen. That's fine. So that has been um, carried, which brings us to the, the last mayoral minute tonight, councillors, um, which is in relation to the uh, development application at 55 Smith Street in Summer Hill. Um, I'll just note before speaking to the matter that um, it's the Inner West Planning Panel that will uh, that will hear this matter. Oh, great to see you back, Councillor Passis. Um, uh, it's the Inner West Planning Panel, not the Joint Regional Planning Panel, which will determine this matter. So I'll ask the minute takers to uh, the minute taker to amend the motion to reflect that, um, and, and I'll speak to the motion very briefly. Councillors will be aware that residential densities in Summer Hill have increased very significantly over recent years through the rezoning of industrial sites for um, medium to high density residential. Uh, that, that's resulted in um, a, a big increase in the local population. Um, Summer Hill is a fantastic place. I think Lackey Street, Summer Hill is one of the best places in the inner west. And certainly that increased population base has contributed to that vibrancy. But it, it does appear um, as though uh, the planning laws are now being used, well, those, those rezonings are being used as a justification, as a precedent for ongoing significant increases in residential density in Summer Hill. Um, and the, the, the new generation boarding house provisions under the planning legislation, which allows for uh, density bonuses for developers has, has been used a number of times in Summer Hill and is now being proposed um, for use at the development that's that's been the de development that's been proposed at 55 Smith Street, which in simple terms would see the conversion of an ex existing employment land um, for uh, residential development of more than a hundred um, more than a hundred uh, uh, units uh, to be defined as new generation boarding houses. O on the weekend, I attend a attended a public meeting which more than 200 local residents um, came to, and they expressed a range of, I think, legitimate concerns about the ongoing um, overdevelopment of Summer Hill. And uh, they made a number of requests uh, from, uh, to me of, uh, for assistance from councillors. Now, I explained to them that councillors are completely removed um, legally from determining development applications, but nonetheless, the motion that I've tabled tonight reflects the requests that were made. So I'm proposing that we write to the chair of the NOS local planning panel, which will consider the development application for 55 Smith Street, requesting that the panel convene a meeting with Summer Hill residents regarding the proposal in order to hear their views, and that we further request that the panel hearing at which the application is to be considered be held in Summer Hill or Ashfield in order to allow residents to attend and their views to be heard that we letterbox all residents in Summer Hill to update them about the status of the development application for 55 Smith Street, explaining the process through which the proposal will be considered by the state government appointed planning panel and how residents can make individual submissions to the panel and to participate in the panel's hearing. And lastly, that we receive a report at the April, at next month's ordinary meeting, summarising all of the significant residential development proposals. And I've picked a random figure of 25 dwellings or more that are under assessment or have been approved uh, in Summer Hill in this term of council. So I, I will move that way. Councillors, discussion? Yes, uh, Mayor. Uh, I had a few calls from a few people who attended that meeting. Yes. And I have um, cited the leaflet that went out and said that uh, councillors were invited to the public meeting 
um, I didn't receive an invite. And um, what councillors were there apart from yourself? Uh, there were apologies from Councillor Kiat and apologies from Councillor Drury. So they'd obviously both been contacted. All right. Okay, then. Um, Mr. Mayor, um, I, I had a bit of feedback from residents that attended that meeting that questions were not answered about notification to residents. And um, a few statements were made by you, which I don't think is in the spirit of a mayor um, attending a public meeting. Um, making those statements and the ward councillors. Sorry, councillor Passes. Sorry, councillor Passes. I'll ask you. I'll call you to order. I'll ask you. I, I know that uh, that I do occupy a lot of your thinking time and comments, but I'll ask uh, you to address the motion rather than reflecting on a meeting that you didn't attend. Well, Mr. Mayor, I did not attend. I wasn't informed of it. And was it convened by the president of the Summerhill branch of the Labor Party? Sorry, councillor Passes. I'll ask you to address the motion. I'm asking you a question. Was it convened? This is what I got back from residents. Was it convened by the, the president of the Summerhill branch of the Labor Party? Sorry, Councillor Passis, the, the floor is yours. You're making your speech. I'm not an officer. I'm happy to address any question you might ask in my right of reply. Please proceed with your remarks and make them relevant to the motion. Of course I go along with this, but residents raised a lot of issues. They did not receive answers. They were they were cut off when they were talking about council and notifications. Councillor Passes, I'll ask you again to address the motion. And I, uh, you, I am addressing not, the motion. Being relevant, and I'll ask you to d discontinue I, your remarks unless you can be relevant to the motion. I, Councillor I Byrne, can I go on the speaking list? I, yes. am, I am relevant to this. People need to know what's going on because there are genuine concerns and not concerns just leading up to the local government election in September. Thank you. Please do not um, disrespect the legitimate concerns the residents have. Councillor Kiat. Councillor Brown, I'm happy to second this motion and um, speak to it briefly. Um, I, I was one of the fortunate uh, councillors of the ward who was contacted by the organisers of the meeting. Um, and uh, unfortunately it was um, Zephyr's first birthday, so I wasn't able to attend. Um, but I, I was glad to see that uh, they were very organized um, uh, around this issue, because as you've outlined, the issues of, of development in Summer Hill are, are very fraught. And yes, the planning laws um, are at risk of failing the residents of that area in a very serious way and the whole community. So uh, it is important that we pay close attention to this issue. Um, I, I won't speak to any more of the substance of the matter, but I, I guess I would just like to address some of the concerns <clears throat> proposed by Councillor Passes, um, or rather raised by Councillor Passes, which is that you know this is some kind of um, election campaigning by the Labor Party. Um, you know, I know that some of the people involved um, happen to be labor luminaries, but that's fine. I think that they're standing up for their area. Um, maybe we could uh, clarify that, you know, this letterbox drop won't be, you know, a letter from the mayor when won't be, it will be, um, you know, a community notification from council um, and that could address that concern. So uh, I would uh, ask mayor as the mover of motion that you consider that um, uh, so that we can, um, address that concern. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor. Sorry, just uh, Councillor, I will come to you, Councillor Stamoulis. Councillor Cap, what was the concern? The concern raised by Councillor Pass is that this is election campaigning, which I don't think it is, um, uh -huh. but we can address that by um, clarifying in, in point two that this layer boxing won't be a big photo of you. Um, it's going to be information that residents need about this um, development yeah. application. That's certainly the case. So what is the, what's the amendment that you're proposing? Well, perhaps I could see clarification from the relevant officers. I mean, do we need an amendment saying that this is not going to have a big face, a uh, big photo of Darcy's face on it? Or is that just going to... Is that just going to happen? Okay, I'll put that question to the officers. Uh, through the chair. Um, the... the, the um, um, uh, Information that goes to uh, residents 
um, uh, whether signed by the mayor or, or otherwise, um, would not normally um, uh, carry uh, the mayoral letterhead. Um, so I think you could be um, uh, you could be assured that um, this letterbox uh, uh, drop would be um, probably signed by the mayor, but uh, but without his um, his face appearing. Well, just for clarity, I'm happy to specify that it wasn't my intention that there'd be any message on this communication from me at all. And obviously we need to be careful um, in regards to, because the state government has um, removed councillors from um, legal involvement in, um, uh, it, from involvement in determining development applications. Um, I'm very happy to specify that, um, that we amend point two to read um, uh, that council Letterboxes, all residents in Summer Hill. Um, it's a public meeting. I'm stating for the record that I won't be requesting any message to, from me to be contained within the communication. Does that satisfy your um, concern, Councillor Kiat? I, I think that's a very fair way to proceed. And I think the direction to the council officers from our discussion is clear. Okay, thank you for that. It, it's a difficult balancing act because as, as we know, the, the previous motion from Councillor de Cruz that I spe specifically be removed from all councillor communications was found to be um, illegal, not in keeping with the Local Government Act. But that we right. also... Know. Yes, well, remember, that. yeah, you'll recall uh, that the general manager was required, was forced to write to everyone explaining that. But I think we've clarified the matter. Councillor Kiat's happy to second the motion, so that's terrific. Further discussion, councillors? Yes, I'd like to. I had, sorry, I had Councillor Stamos and then I've got Councillor McKenna and then I'll go to Councillor De Cruz. Um, yes, Mr Mayor, um, in terms of this meeting, um, on our previous council, uh, councils, uh, council itself would be on the front foot organising public meetings and it wasn't just ward councillors that would attend. In fact, we'd have councillors from right across the council that would be attending meetings uh, certain, certainly uh, meetings uh, that would relate to um, a development like this, which requires a mayoral minute, you'd expect many uh, councillors to be attending. Maybe we need to get on the front foot for our residents and make sure they are public meetings and as many councillors as possible uh, get, um, get invited to these. That's the first thing. And the second thing is uh, our notifications policy. Um, we're letterboxing all residents in Summer Hill. Uh, most councillors would know. I've debated strongly to make sure that our notifications is even wider uh, than um, than what we have uh, currently written down here. But we're letterboxing all residents in Summer Hill, which is um, inconsistent with other major developments that we've done uh, throughout this term of council. And I'm wondering why this one is uh, distinctly different from others where we haven't letterboxed uh, the entire suburb. I'd like to put that question to whoever might be able to answer it. Thank you. Well, um, I think the motion speaks for itself, so I don't know that I can answer it. I'm happy to put your question to the council officers. Uh, th through the chair, um, we would act on um, any lawful motion um, passed by council. If council directs that um, all residents in Summer Hill are letterbox dropped, then uh, we'll comply. Thank you well, for that. Right. Councillor right, McKenna. Councillor McKenna. Councillor McKenna. Um, thank you, Mayor, um, and thank you, Councillors. This look, this is a huge issue. I mean, Summer Hill is a very small area. Um, there, like lots of parts of the Inner West Council, um, very little, very small frontages, um, very little off-street parking. Um, the absolute um, influx of these um, new age boarding houses is creating a huge problem in the area. Um, just in the last couple of, the last 12 or 18 months, there's been um, new um, boarding houses proposed in, in um, the old ambulance station. There's nearly 200 rooms there, um, not a single car parking space. Um, and that was, that was determined by the Sydney East planning panel, which, um, I went in and spoke to them and pleaded with them to um, at least put in the parking spaces that our council officers said should be there, but they proposed uh, without it. So um, there are new uh, new buildings proposed in Gower Street. There's there's buildings in Grosvenor Crescent. There's 
there in Ormond Street, in uh, Ashfield, Pembroke Street, Liverpool Road. They're absolutely all, they're swamping us with these new age boarding houses. Now, the reality is, if you go and look at any of these buildings on any given night, um, half of them are empty. So I really don't understand what this is all about. And I can assure you, as I live opposite a fairly recent building of 30 units, and um, there would be lucky to be 50% of them let, and there are no long-term tenants in them. They're just very, very transient. So it's not community building either. So while this sort of development works um, for uh, um, some people, and it's appropriate that we have some of this type, we're just going to be swamped and have far too many, um, and it's going to create a whole range of other problems. So I support wholeheartedly this um, process to engage with the community so they actually understand because people don't understand what's happening. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor McKenna. Councillor De Cruz. Um, thanks, Chair. Um, I, I think there's there's a, cu a couple of things tied up in this motion. Um, particular concerns of a particular group of people with a particular development application. But this is happening right across the inner west. Um, people are not being notified. We know that planning alerts no longer works, so people don't know when DAs are happening. We're not notifying in newspapers. Um, our briefing note today said they're proposing a new uh, community engagement policy and we're going to put a notification on some obscure page on our website. Um, so I think our notification processes need to be reviewed um, and so that, that's in regard to point two, um, that you feel that it's necessary to suddenly letterbox the whole of Summer Hill to tell them about this particular development application. Um, and with regard to point three, I think we should be informed regularly about what sort of DAs are being approved, um, what sort of DAs are coming up. Um, so I think that sort of reporting to council has been very poor and it should be just routine. Um, going back to um, the letterboxing and the, and the notification, I think we really do need to um, look at the community engagement process and I don't know that it can be done in amending your motion. Um, and look at seriously um, giving back the people of Marrickville and um, Leichhardt especially the features offered by planning alerts so that they could be aware of what planning um, applications there were in their area. Um, with regard to point one, you actually just referred to my amendments to the council newsletter. I would suggest that Throughout the Inner West, people need to know about the new planning procedures and processes and that the council newsletter would be an ideal way to communicate that to all our community. Um, I think we'll find, we, you'll find that with my um, amendment to the, uh, my um, motion that I brought to the last um, motion in regard to the newsletters, it was in regard to the fact that we didn't have, need hundreds of photographs of yourself. And I'm pleased to say that the latest issue had um, all photographs, photographs of yourself. Whereas Sorry, you Councillor DeCruz. Sorry, Councillor DeCruz. I'll, I'll, I'll ask you to address the motion. So I, I think your motion has merit, but I'm a bit puzzled why you seem to think that it's only applicable to one DA. So... Um, and I don't see the need to letterbox the whole of Summer Hill. I mean, perhaps this information could be put in the newsletter and the whole of the Inner West could be provided with how the planning panel works. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Councillor De Cruz. Further discussion, councillors? There's no further discussion. I'll make a brief right of reply. Um, uh, I think it's the responsibility of each councillor to, um, to be engaged with the local community. I, I attend meetings that I'm invited to attend. I don't consider it to be my responsibility to extend that invitation when I receive one to any other councillor and I don't believe any other councillor considers that to be their responsibility in regards to me or anybody else. I think it's a bad practice to start getting to get into um, questioning people's political affiliations, 
or um, making assertions about citizens within the community who have organised a public meeting. Uh, I, I don't think it matters whether people, whether anyone has a political affiliation. It seemed to me that in such a, a well attended meeting that there were people from all different backgrounds. Uh, that they didn't have to sign a form on the way in identifying that they'd vote for Councillor Passis or Councillor Drury or Councillor Kiat. So I don't consider any of that to be relevant. Um, in relation to the point raised by Councillor de Cruz, um, uh, look, I, I agree with the criticism, with the concerns that you have about what some of the unintended consequences have been of the, the implementation of the planning panel um, and, and the way that um, uh, the effects that have been, been seen on the community through having no democratic involvement in that process. Uh, in this instance, there is clearly an issue with overdevelopment in Summer Hill. Uh, this particular proposal, whilst it is very significant and in my view, a, a large scale overdevelopment, it is also symbolic of the, and, and has captured people's attention because it epitomises the process that is, that is happening in Summer Hill. So I don't think it's inappropriate that there be a specific notification to the, the whole suburb. And that was the request of the, the, res, the, the residents that I spoke to at the meeting. So I'll now put that motion. All those in favour, please raise your hands and keep them raised. In support, I have councillors McKenna, Stamoulis, Passus, Hesse, Iskander, Kiat, Lockie, Porteous, York. Councillor Steer, are you in support? Support. Thank you. And all those against? Against, I have councillors. Well, Councillor De Cruz, are you abstaining? No, I'm for. You're for the motion. And hopefully okay. you'll support that we provide this information in our newsletter. Keep going. Councillor Macri, are you for or against the motion? No, Councillor Macri has departed. So that has been carried. Uh, now, councillors, that brings us to the reports for council decision. At the suggestion... Could I, could I have the... the sorry, Councillor Passage, just one <laughs> moment. At the suggestion of uh, multiple councillors at the last meeting, I think it was the last meeting, um, and of the general manager, I, I attempted to go through the list and see whether we could do what had been standard practice at, um, at Leichhardt Council, Maricourt Council and Ashfield Councils previously, and bring forward items to move in bulk, which no one needs to speak to or wishes to amend. So uh, can I just get an indication? Does any, any councillor object to me just briefly going through each item and see if there's any that we could adopt without ne the need for debate? Mr no? Mayor, I think we should debate. There must be serious issues or they wouldn't be on the agenda. So Councillor Passis is objecting to that, to me trying to go through the list to move anything at all in bulk. Is anyone else objecting to it? No? Okay. So I'll just ask people to sing out. I'm going to go through each item. As I, as I name the item, if you, I'll ask whether anyone wishes to debate it or amend it. If a single person says yes, then we'll leave it and we'll go back and deal with it. So it'll only be things that no one responds to that we then seek to move in bulk. Hopefully it's a few items because that would expedite the meeting. Draft car share policy. Does anyone wish to debate yes. or amend that? I wish to debate yep. that. Right. Yes. Yep. Item two, Dulwich Hill Parklands, plan of management. I, yes. I wish to move an amendment in regards to that. Balmain Leagues Voluntary Planning Agreement Engagement Outcomes Report. That's okay. Yes. No, Councillor Porteous no. wishes to deal with that. That's fine. White's Creek Valley Park reclassification of park area. I wish to deal with that one. Local Traffic Committee meeting. Committee meeting. Yes, I want to make an amendment yes. on that one. Thank you. you National, yes. National General Assembly of Local Government requires nomination of delegates, so that'll have to be dealt with. Proposed Local Government Remuneration Tribunal <laughs> submission. No, we don't have to speak on that. Okay, so that's one that we could bring forward. Inner West Community Energy Practitioner Network. It's a receiver note. Any discussion on that? Yep, I'd like to. Okay. Investment report. No, that can be moved in bulk. Council's insurance claim processing system. I want to deal with that. So do I. 
Notice of motion, Yabsley Avenue, Ashfield. Yep. You wish to discuss it, Councillor Passus? Yes. Notice of motion, inclusion. Uh, point of order, uh, Councillor Byrne. We do normally uh, deal with the notice of motions separately to give the mover an opportunity to speak. Hold on. You... This is the disagreement we had last time, and I, I quoted you about how you'd always insisted that on, the, on Leichhardt Council, and you said, no, I was wrong, and then we moved a couple of the motions involved. Well, we're, wasting I can break, time. we're wasting if time. I, if I can break the impasse, I, I don't think I need to speak to item 12. Well, well that's irrelevant because Councillor Passis has asked to debate it. Check. Discuss it so. uh, I'll call the meeting to order. I'll call the meeting to order. Item 12, notice of motion, inclusion of solar panels. Councillor Katz indicated he doesn't need to speak to it. Okay, that can be moved in bulk. Uh, item 13, Councillor Porteous's motion. Do you wish to speak to it, Councillor Porteous? I'll have to assume that's a yes. I can't hear Councillor Porteous. Notice of motion on the Greenway. Yes, I wish yes. To discuss that. Okay, both of those. Traffic assessment around Ashfield Pool. I wish to discuss that. Notice of motion, West Connects Lilyfield Road. Does anyone wish to debate that? No, that can go through in bulk. Uh, print and post infringement notice. I'm happy yes. not to speak to it. Yes, I would like to speak to it. Okay. Cement Australia throughput increase application. I don't need to speak to it. Does anyone wish to debate that? No, that can be moved in bulk. And then uh, that brings us to the questions on notice and the confidential session. So uh, I believe the items that we have to move in bulk are items seven, proposed local government remuneration tribunal submission, eight, inner west community energy practitioner network, nine, investment report, <clears throat> 16, Lilyfield Road, 18, Cement Australia. And 12 and 12, inclusion of solar panels. So I'll move that those items be adopted, seconded by I'll Councillor second. Stamoulis. Seconded by Councillor Stamoulis. All those in favour, against, declare that carriage unanimously. That brings uh, us Mayor, to, I'd like, to item I one, some, draft car share policy. Could I, could I have some clarification before we go any further on the last vote? Um, the general Mr. Barrett, uh, made um, a statement that if a councillor has left a room, um, that he, that, that councillor is against the um, resolution. Um, when Councillor Rossiti weren't um, in the room and didn't vote, are they down as against the resolution or they've left the room? Councillor uh, Rossiti is an apology for the meeting, Councillor Passes. Well, Councillor Macri, did he vote against it or was it he was absent? I think, Mr Barrett, um, you're incorrect saying that when a councillor is not in the room... Um, sorry, Councillor. Sorry, Councillor Passus. I'm going to move on with the agenda and there'll be... I'd like some clarification on that. OK, well, I'll seek clarification. I think he was already pretty clear, the General Manager, but I'll put the question to him again. And then, of course, there's an opportunity to correct the record when the minutes are tabled at the subsequent meeting. Uh, I'll just ask the, the, the general manager it, it, for confirmation. Through, through the chair. Or, 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 uh, yes, I think uh, Councillor Passis's uh, clarification is correct. You would normally be recorded in the system as absent, i.e. physically outside the chamber or electronically outside the chamber. Thank but you. the effect of that is that you wouldn't be voting for it. Thank you. So it's not that they're against the resolution. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much. Okay. Item one, draft car share policy. Uh, yeah, I'd like to move a couple of amendments. I'd like to speak on these two, please. Councillor Porteous. Thank you. Uh, look, I'd like to thank the staff for the work that they've done on bringing this policy forward. Um, just a couple of items. On point four, the eligibility to operate a car share scheme in the inner west uh, local government area. Uh, I was unclear about 4.5 in terms of the way it's worded. Um, so I've got some clarification from staff on that. Uh, I think it's really unnecessary to say that um, 
if you use it at the same time on a regular basis, therefore um, that should preclude the eligibility of the car share um, operator to um, be uh, approved by the um, council. Uh, I, I do think that there's a role actually for regular use of a um, car share, which still enables um, a, a reduction in the number of cars that are actually going to be uh, used locally because it's identifying only the critical time when a regular user might be using it. So I also find it quite confusing, the wording on that. So I think it's probably best just to remove 4.5. I'm proposing that we remove 4.5. And the other issue is uh, when I went through the document, there was nothing on accessibility at all. Um, and I think that it's important that, and I have spoken to the council officers about this as well, uh, and they have suggested that a new section on accessibility be added to this policy. So it's outlining the accessibility requirements that co companies need to have when they're contracting with council. And um, examples, for example, that there would be uh, vehicles available that are also suitable for people with disabilities, parking spaces suitable for vehicles which would need appropriate access, uh, potentially vehicles which also would take a wheelchair, those sort of things. Um, so I'd ask that those both be added as amendments to the car share policy before it goes out in exhibition. Thanks. Thanks for that, Councillor Porteous. Is there a seconder for the motion? Second. I'll second it. Councillor McKenna has indicated that she'll second the motion. Yeah. Do, you speak, do you wish to speak to it, Councillor McKenna? Um, just briefly, um, thank you for this. It's um, it's good. Um, I'm just a little concerned that it really refers to the organisations like GoGet that are actually companies that are very organised. Um, it doesn't, I couldn't see in the policy where it spoke about the unregulated car share. So is, could, could I just ask the officers, is there any intention that we would try and manage the, even just for the places where they can park, the unregulated ones like um, car next door? Could we I'll ask put that question to officers? the officers. Uh, through the chair, thank you uh, for your question. Um, staff are very aware um, that there sort of is a dominance, particularly of one company um, in the inner west, and we are very keen to increase competition. Um, so we've spoken to some other councils about what they've done um, to attract other companies to the area. Um, so we're looking at doing things like reduce application rates for new operators, um, a provision which allows council to invite applications for the use of existing spaces, a provision which allows council to invite applications for newly proposed car share spaces by different operators, um, and applications for new parking spaces are not based on demonstrated demand, um, but that can be removed if that demand isn't demonstrated once installed. So, yes, we are looking to expand it to include other operators. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. That's, that's it. That's Thank, it. You. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for that. Further discussion, councillors. Yes, I've got. Councillor Steer. Councillor De Cruz. Councillor De Cruz. Thanks. Um, yeah, one of the issues um, a resident raised with me in regard to car share is that they have reserved car spaces, and but. Uh, but users return it to a different car space, therefore tying up a resident parking space and leaving the reserved car space um, vacant. So could the officers clarify um, what the policy says in regard to using, um, to returning cars, cars to their designated, their designated car space? space. I'll put that question to the office, officers just before doing so. I'll ask the Deputy Mayor to take over the chairing of the meeting momentarily so that I can have a, a quick break. And I'll put that question to the officers first. Uh, thank you. Through the Chair. Um, the intent is that the vehicle is returned to its designated spot. The only reason a member would not do that is if someone has unlawfully parked in that spot. 
Um, now, the policy does say, um, and I believe it's in Section 7, that a marked car share vehicle may park park within a resident zone um, if, and it has the same parking exemption in that in that permit area and that's for that case where that vehicle returns and someone has unlawfully parked in that space. Um, but I will note that every car share vehicle results in a re reduction of seven to ten privately owned vehicles and that's because car share members put off purchasing a vehicle or sell an existing vehicle when they participate in the scheme. So the overall um, effect of the scheme is to reduce the overall demand for parking. Thanks for that. Okay. okay. May I speak? Uh, Councillor de Cruz, have you finished? Yep, finished. Yep. Okay, thank you. Councillor Passas, you may begin. Yes. Um, I don't think um, the issues that Councillor Portis raised is, is going to be easily um, got around. That's, it's very, very problematic. Um, however, if there's any way we could do something okay, but in this type of uh, business, I don't think it can happen. My main concern is that uh, through you, uh, Chair, to the relevant officer, I haven't seen anything about these car share people paying for these spots. I have for three years tried to get a business um, permit for bu uh, numerous businesses in Ashfield and there's no business permits. This car share is a business. And I would like to know why we are not charging them for um, having their own designated spot. So can you tell me why and I would like to move an amendment that it has to come back with a report that we must start charging these people. It's yes, a business. Is, is that a question through to the officer? Yes, the officer? I'll wait for the answer, yes. yes. Uh, relevant officer, can they answer that question, please? Thank you, through the chair. Um, section eight of the draft policy outlines the fees and charges that we do propose to charge. Um, so, so the car share company would be responsible for infrastructure costs of installing new car share spaces, the administration costs um, associated with that, and any staff time dedicated to the expansion of the car share network. To the sort of broader question that Councillor Passis has raised, under the new public domain parking policy, there are some additional allowances for resident parking and, and business parking. So. Um, I'm happy to have an offline conversation with you about that. Yes, because even a lot of car parks, um, you, you have to pay after a certain time. And um, these people have their vehicles parked on in these spots 24 seven. There's one around the corner from me, uh, right near a nursing home where um, people visiting their spouses and their partners have uh, attracted so many parking tickets and the elderly that are vi visiting their elderly spouse are not um, able to park miles away and walk. And yet we've got a go-get car parked there where they could be parking to visit their family. This is very, very, uh, this is wrong. And everybody else has to pay. Business, this is a business. This is not a voluntary organization. Letting people use the vehicles for free. They do a good service, yes. A lot of people do good services, so do taxis, but they have to pay taxes and they have to pay uh, things. So I cannot see, it doesn't matter that they pay to put the lines on the road or they have to pay to put anything into council. So does everybody else. They should be paying parking permits and much more than what our residents are paying. Councillor Macri. Yes, Councillor Stamolis. Yeah, um, I'm looking at the, the uh, types of data that's, uh, that's available here um, in this report, uh, Section 5, and um, it would be lovely with policies such as this, which council is aiming to sort of expand and increase, that councillors did get some data uh, back on the odd occasion. As, as someone who's worked in the, as a statistician for 40 years, um, 
when I see things increasing by 35% each year, I know that's going to be very, very noticeable. Uh, but I certainly haven't noticed a 35% increase each year for 10 years uh, amongst inner West, inner West residents. So obviously there's something in the stats there uh, that I need to understand and possibly other councillors need to understand better. If something's increasing at that rate, boy, it becomes extremely visible in a, in a very, very short time. And, and I don't think that visibility is there as far as I can see it. Certainly you see the cards, there's no doubt about that but uh, I'm talking about the rate of increase over that 10 years. So it would be nice to find out a little bit more about this because it's an extremely important uh, policy. Uh, if there's any data that can be shared with councillors, that, that would be wonderful. And finally, how many spaces do we actually reserve for car share? Now, we, we, we know that the, our car share can park anywhere in the municipality, that's, that's obvious. Um, but in terms of the ones that are reserved for car share, could I put a question through the... Uh, through uh, Councillor Macri to the relevant officer. Thank you. Certainly, uh, the relevant officer can may answer that. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, Councillor Stamolis, we'd be more than happy to provide you with some statistics on car share. Um, we, we do obtain those statistics regularly from the car share companies. Um, I'm more than happy to provide that to you. In terms of the actual total number of spaces, I'm afraid I didn't actually get that number in preparation for this meeting, so I'll have to take that on notice. Thank you, and, and I hope that data is available not just to me, but to all councillors so that they can try and understand these increases, possibly even where they're occurring, so that we can develop our policies around it. Thank you. Uh, any further speakers? No further speakers. I'll, I'll just chime in and say a couple of things. I have been contacted by a few residents that are concerned about the competition for parking spots. But I, I try and explain to them, well, the idea is hopefully, eventually, once it takes on, it will relieve pressure on the spots. They also raise concerns with me, the fact that they are not a non-for-profit. They are making money and making profit and doing quite well out of it. As we see, the numbers increasing. And they are a bit incensed that they have to pay for parking permits. I think once this policy comes back, if we get feedback that the actual other residents would prefer that, uh, I think they should be at least charged a what the residents are actually charged, that a resident's parking fee per allocated spot. If it comes back with that information, I'll flag now. I'll have no hesitation in actually moving that way. Okay. So I'll put the motion. Or does Council Portis, would you like to actually close? Uh, no, look, I'm happy to waive my right of re reply. Thank you. Okay. All right, I'll put that. All those in favour say aye. Just, to your point, aye. just a minute, uh, Chair. Um, what, what is the outcome of this? What is coming back to councillors? It's going out for advertising, public exhibition. The things we raised, raised tonight, certain councillors have raised tonight. Yes. Um, Shouldn't we be looking at whether they are going to be implemented or looking at that, or we shouldn't be going out for public exhibition? We, we, need, we need to get the information back from the residents to see where, where they sit with this council of passes. So okay, thank you. Everyone raise their hands that are in favour. Is it easier to say who's against? Can anyone sing out who is against? I don't hear anyone's voice, so I presume that's unanimous. Okay, we'll move to... Dulwich Hill Parklands. I believe there's been some amendments. Yeah, I'm happy to move for the sake of moving um, the amendment that Councillor Drury circulated earlier today in his absence. Yep, yep. so that's Councillor York. Yep, I believe he's um, provided that to you, Catherine, but let me know if you'd like me to send it through. It's the point about noting that the parklands provide critical habitat for flora for fauna and flora and that close management there at point three, with local Anna. environment groups, etc. Yep, Perfect. that's there at point three. Great. Okay. And Councillor McKenna, you want to second it, do you? Or do you want to speak to it? I can't hear you. You're not speaking to it. Okay. Second the um, way. Councillor Mac. Councillor yep. uh, Kiat, yes. Yeah, Councillor Macri, um, I'd like to move 
um, an amendment which I've circulated as well um, at Councillor Drury's um, recommendation. I've, I've knocked off a few items which are just noting um, some things that Council is already doing and I'll speak to them very briefly. That is um, uh, some concerns were raised with me about the ongoing maintenance of the street library in uh, on the Greenway at, at Arlington Reserve. Um, and I've been assured that the maintenance under this plan of management will be going, ongoing. And another point around um, the provision of shade at the playground at Hopkins Park. Um, I'm advised that when the playground is upgraded, that shade will be considered in that process. So um, I don't need to deal with those, but th so the amendments that are tabled relate to Arlington Reserve will all be familiar with the issues there. Um, and I'm simply seeking that um, uh, I'll deal with the second point first. Um, we know that the community in that area and, and the club is being consulted on uh, an operational plan. Um, I'd, I'd just like to uh, ensure that that comes back for our consideration soon uh, because um, we know that the issues are ongoing and I think we need to try and deal with this issue um, yeah. and, and bring it forward. Well, I don't think anything needs to be um, said about that. The, the first point um, is mm. in relation to the plan of management in re and in relation to Arlington Reserve. I think that we need to look at the issue of noise abatement structures. Um, I don't think that we can um, say for sure that we'll be able to do it at Arlington. Um, I think we, we will be talking about Lambert Park later. That's a good example of, of a very good noise abatement structure, a very large wall around the whole park. That's probably not what we want for Arlington, but if there are options out there, I think they should be investigated and, and considered by council. So I'd like that to be included in the actions for, for um, Arlington Reserve. I will, I will ask the movers of the motion, are they prepared to accept those amendments into the motion? I'm happy to incorporate them on the basis that I know in Councillor Drury's absence that he um, was happy to support them unless there's furious need to debate them amongst other councillors. I, I'm, I think they're reasonable and happy to incorporate I'm, them. I'm fairly comfortable with them. Uh, Councillor McKenna, you want to say something? Oh, you're saying it's okay. Oh, good. Sign language is working well. <laughs> um, if there's no need to any further discussion on these, do we just put Put the motion in. I'm happy with that, Councillor Macri. Well, let's put it to the vote. All those in favour, say aye. Those against, mm. can I hear anyone against? Well, let, let's call it unanimous. Hey, that's done. You have to make your chair more often, Vic. It's two unanimous in a row. Oh, well, it's scary, isn't it? Item three, the Balmain Leagues Club. Uh, is there a move of motion or someone was interested in that? Don't hear anyone. Look, uh, Councillor McCann. Yeah, need I'll come. move it. I'll move it, but move it. I don't have anything to say. I'm happy for it to go through. Okay, well, I'll second it if it speeds things up. Um, any discussion? No discussion. Anyone? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. So I saw Councillor Stamolis jump first. Then I heard uh, Councillor Portis. Councillor Stamolis. Look. Um, Fellow councillors, I, I found this VPA um, difficult to understand. So, so one of the, and, and I know it's been around a fair while, but uh, in terms of the, the deals that council negotiates, um, I've noticed that, that there's a number of things here amounting to what's 45% uh, of the dollar value of the total uh, VPA that cease after 25 years. Um, I'd like to put a question through the chair as to whether ordinarily that would be our approach to a VPA or whether we'd be expecting um, a more permanent, such as the laneways, the, the square, uh, that sort of thing, or the financial contributions. Um, so I'd like to put that question through as to why, um, as I see it here, uh, up to 45% of this agreement terminates in 25 years. So what would have been the sort of reasoning behind that? Thank you. Uh, through to the relevant officer. 
Uh, through you, um, Mr. Deputy Mayor, um, councils, when we're negotiating voluntary planning agreements, it's all done uh, under the framework of our voluntary planning agreement policy that council has adopted um, that, that seeks for council um, to effectively um, capture 50% of the value of the uplift in land value associated with a particular um, planning proposal or development application. In this particular circumstance, um, as it happens, um, the, the developer has offered um, a, a series of um, premises for lease for 25 years. Um, that in its own right um, is not necessarily unusual. Um, and we have had situations like this previously. What is what we are guided by in this circumstance is the value of that 25 year lease. Um, and the, 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 the quantum of that is sitting um, on or about that 50% uplift in land value set out in the policy. Does that assist you, Councillor Stamolis? Look, look it, it, it does. It, it says to me that it's not unusual, but um, I'm wondering whether this is something that councillors uh, would, would like to think more about in future, so, you know, the type of benefit that comes to our public that... Are, um, we will be wearing quite a significant developing, development on this site for many, many years ahead. We would like to see those financial contributions that come to us or the infrastructure put in place for our community be more permanent than, um, uh, than uh, you know, we're leasing something for a dollar a year for 25 years that derives a particular benefit to um, uh to council, look, I, I think that's something that's worth considering for council, certainly for, for future BPAs, but I, I do have my reservations there. Thank you. Uh, council Claudius. Yeah, a couple of questions to the staff and then yep. I'll speak briefly. Uh, look, in terms of the uh, facilities that are being provided for periods of time, I'm assuming that, for example, the town square, the um, commercial space, um, the public parking and that that uh, we would be responsible for the maintenance, the cleaning, et cetera, for that, for those sites. So there'd be significant uh, cost imposts on us for these um, items. Uh, could I get a clarification on that? Uh, through the relevant officer? Um, through you. It depends on the, the type um, of the benefit that we're talking about councillors. So the town square in this instance um, is certain that's simply providing um, council access to that. So we don't incur any um, ongoing maintenance um, obligation associated with that. Um, with respect to the, the public car park, um, you, you'll note in the report, it talks about that, that, um, that the lease for a dollar a year for 25 years of those 130 car parking spaces um, is to be a gross lease that is inclusive of the outgoings, um, but doesn't include utilities charges so that we would um, be responsible for paying for electricity and the like, um, but that cleaning would be covered within that lease um, charge. Okay. Councillor Porteous, does that thank you. satisfy your questions? Yes, no, thank you for that. Um, look, um, I um, had a look at this voluntary planning agreement. I'm not convinced on a lot of the valuations that have been put uh, to the current proposal. Some of those obviously are requirements in terms of the development approval, certainly the uh, commercial space that's being provided. That's actually a requirement with, within the... Um, development approval that 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 be provided was previously a club site and now it's been converted into a commercial space which uh, needs to be for community benefit. Um, I note that monetary con contributions in part have gone down. A lot of these are in kind um, contributions. Considering uh, the actual size of this development, they are you know reasonably small to be quite honest. Um, so I think it's pretty disappointing. Having said that, I, I really don't agree with voluntary planning agreements. Uh, I think that they, at the end of the day, I see them as a, something which is uh, unacceptable in terms of um, the fact that they they seem to be presented as some kind of compensation for the local community, when in fact they're in no way a, a comp compensation for the impost of having very, very large developments with significant uh, amenity impacts landed on your front door. 
uh, which you're going to have to live with for the rest of your life unless you move. Um, it's, you know, that this in no way compensates for that. So for that reason alone, um, I won't be supporting the voluntary planning agreement this evening. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, any further speakers? If there's no further speakers, does the... I've, I've just got a question, Councillor Macri, it's Councillor De Cruz. Councillor De Cruz, yes. Um, there's been discussion about the site being acquired by West Connect. Where does that leave us with this voluntary planning agreement? Will we get compensation to the amount that's been discussed? Uh, through to the relevant officer. Um, councils, I'm not going to profess to offer you, offer you a legal opinion on this other than to, to explain that the VPA sits with the land um, and, and I've got an echo that. Um, uh, hypothetically, um, you know, once that the, the um, Western Harbour Tunnel dive site um, is returned to the to the property owner in five, six, seven, however many years, um, that the development could at, at that point hypothetically be proceeding. Um, at which point the VPA would be enacted at that time. Okay, okay. Councillor Macri, can I um, can I just re return to the meeting and speak brief briefly on the item, please? All yours, Chair. Thanks very much. Uh, could I, I, think could I, think I just ask a further question since I still have the floor, I think? Sorry um, about that. Yes, please do. Uh, with, with this VPA, what kind of liability? We've already heard that we're up for, clean, for utilities and things like that. Are we up for strata fees as well? Uh, through the chair, um, no, I believe that they were all inclusive in those in those lease terms. Right. Councillor De Cruz, that's fine. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, I, I think it is important to note that, um, in, in a sense, given this, this the situation um, that currently stands, the VPA is redundant, or at least it redundant for the, the medium term, uh, the government has made absolutely clear through their approval of the Western Harbour Tunnel project that they will be acquiring this site. And um, whilst there's no legal opinion that can be offered here, it seems common sense that, that the planning law would dictate that we're not going to receive voluntary planning agreement contributions to council for a development that is not proceeding and that we wouldn't receive those contributions until the development did proceed. Um, I have written recently to uh, Andrew Constance, uh, to, uh, well, who, who has so far refused to meet with the representatives of West Ashfield and the Bowmain Leagues Club, um, and I have um, sought a, a response from him as to what compensation could be provided or will be provided to the club uh, in regards to the compulsory acquisition. It, it's certainly not an encouraging sign, the fact that the government has made no offer at all, not a cent of compensation, and has not even approached um, West Tigers or West Ashfield or the, or the um, Balmain Tigers Football Club to discuss the matter. Um, so I, th I think that speaks for itself. In relation to the VPA, were this development to proceed now, or in five or seven years' time, and who knows whether that would be the case if the site is acquired. Um, the development will be proceeding regardless of whether the, the voluntary planning agreement is uh, endorsed by council or not. So to put it another way, to vote against the VPA has no impact at all on the development proceeding, but were a majority of councillors to vote against it, then we would be foregoing um, uh, an enormous sum of money that would otherwise be dedicated to uh, improving public amenity in the local community that will be impacted by this development. So uh, with, with great respect to um, councillors who have um, said that they were voting against the VPA, I, I don't see how that is in the public interest. I'll, I'll leave it there. So the, the mover is Councillor McKenna, the seconder is Councillor Macri. Do you wish to speak to it, Councillor McKenna? No. Thanks very much. Oh, sorry, do you wish to make a right of reply? Thanks very much. I'll, uh, I'll now put the motion. All those in favour, please raise your hands. In support, I have support myself, myself. Councillor McKenna, Councillor Stamoulis, 
Councillors De Cruz, Passus. Councillor Macri, are you in support or against? Councillor Macri, Iskander, Kiat, Lockie, York, Steer. Councillor De Cruz, are you in support or against? Sorry, I just can't see you on the screen. Councillor De Cruz? Support. Councillor De Cruz is in support. And all those against, please raise your hands. Against, I have Councillors Hesse and Porteous. Councillor Steer, are you for or against the motion? I'm for it. Councillor Steer is for. That has been carried. Next item, item four, Wikes Creek Valley reclassification of park area as off leash. I wish to move the officer's recommendation with a slight amendment. Um, well, actually it's a, it's a different primary motion really. Um, I, I'd like to propose that consultation be undertaken with the park users on the compromise position, which has been tabled for consideration at council tonight. I, I, I have been contacted by a number of residents who were um, concerned by the original decision at council, largely because they were unfamiliar with why it had been undertaken. Now, we're all aware of the reasons for that because there were legal issues at play and the matter was considered in confidential session. I, I do want to thank the council officers for um, uh, working to try to identify a, a, a compromise solution. I, I'm not really familiar enough with um, the, the precise dynamics at the park to know whether what's being proposed in this report will work. Uh, it's encouraging that the, um, the person who had been objecting to uh, the person who had instigated the request for the removal of off-leash areas has um, indicated, according to the report, their support for uh, this compromise solution. But we really do have to go and talk to the community about it. Um, it, it was far from ideal to have um, at least what was perceived to be one person complaining about the existing arrangements. And then, uh, according to the petition, we've received hundreds of local people who, who disagreed with the decision. Um, obviously, it's a complicated matter because of the legal issues that we're um, not able to discuss in full. So I want to thank the staff, the council officers, for having worked on a compromise. Now's the time to go and talk to the, the park users to see whether it's something that they support. And so um, I'll, um, I'll propose that. Is there a seconder for that motion? I'm happy to second that. That's seconded by Councillor De Cruz. Do you wish to speak to it? Um, I guess briefly, I might just say that I have uh, quite familiar with the area. I'm aware that there's bush care, and um, yeah, look, I think that there is a real problem, of, and it is worth discussing it with the community. There was concern previously that there was no consultation when it was previously changed, and I think consultation on this matter and discussion with the community would be a good thing. Thanks. Sorry about that, I was on mute. Are there any other speakers? Uh, Mr. Mayor. Yes, Councillor Stamos. Uh, look, um, so, so your consultation would be about um, um, revoking the on leash uh, provision. So that's generally it. You'd, you'd be opening up that discussion and the various options around that, or is there something else that would Sorry, be. Sorry, and I, I apologise to the minute takers because I haven't provided this wording in writing. But I'm proposing that consultation occur with park users on the proposal tabled at council tonight. Oh, thank you. Can I ask the minute takers just to amend the wording to reflect what I've just said? I'm happy to send it through via email if it's if it's if that's preferable. Catherine, can you just repeat your motion, please, ma'am? The consultation be undertaken with park users on the. Um, proposal tabled in the report. May I ask a question? Just a moment. I just want to make sure that we get the wording so we know what we're voting on. Uh, uh, sorry, just to, for clarity, uh, on the proposal in the report rather than with the proposal in the report. Thanks very much for that, Catherine. Councillor Passus? Yes, um, look, I'm, 
not being a dog owner myself, I just want some clarification on this. So what we're doing is we're going from um, on leash to off leash. We're doing. I'll put that question to the council officers. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, when council last considered the matter in October 2020, a decision was made to make the entirety um, of this section of the park um, an on-leash area. So it was previously, before October 2020, it was off-leash. Um, it, at the present day, it is on leash, um, and the officers have presented you this evening a compromise position um, that would see the overwhelming majority of the park returned um, back to being an off leash area. Um, would that be any cost to um, council? Because we're, if we're, we're reverting back again, I, I suppose this might be a legal question, but if we decided to go off leash again and there was um, an attack or something, where would council stand on that? I know you're not a legal person, but this is- oh, And I don't know that council council is, council would be, be liable for that. And the, the legal issues associated with the um, initial bringing of this matter to council and the potential uh, legal ramifications of that is outlined in our report in October. Okay, thank you for that. Well, so what we're voting on tonight is just go out for consultation. Uh, the, the motion's tabled on the screen, Councillor Passis. So if there's yeah, no there's further discussion, I'll put, I'll put the burn de Cruz motion. All those in favour, please raise your hands and keep them raised. In support, I have, I, I think it's unanimous. Does anyone wish to be recorded as voting against the motion? That's been carried unanimously. That brings us that to brings item. Us to that brings us to item five, local traffic committee meeting. Just, yes, please, Mayor. Please, I would sorry, like sorry, to. Sorry, just a second, Councillor Steer. I'll just first of all go to the chair of the traffic committee, uh, Councillor Macri. Did you wish to clarify anything or um, put any questions to officers in regards to the issues that were raised in the public forum tonight? No, hey, Chair. I'm okay, fine. thank you, Councillor Steer. Yes, Chair. I I would like to move the minutes with an amendment to item seven that I've already sent around to all the councillors. Um, and that um, amendment is that instead of removing the um, uh, parking spot at 11 Bruce Street, that it be reinstated. I've sent the actual wording to the, um, to the officer and she can put that up. May I speak? Oh, yeah. Sorry, just, just a moment, Councillor Passes. So Councillor Steer has moved the adoption of the minutes with the amendment that has been tabled. I'm happy to second that motion, but I also have an amendment that I'd like to propose or, or, or speak to, uh, but I'm happy to withhold my right to speak and I can come back to that. Councillor Passes. Yes, um, where I sympathise with the resident... Um, uh, excuse me, I would like to address the meeting before Councillor Passes uh, says anything because it is my motion. Yeah, um, I, so, and, sorry, sorry Councillor Steele. I, was, I haven't spoken to it yet. No, I was under the impression that you that you already that you didn't need to, but that's fine. I'll, please, please proceed. I will be brief. <laughs> um, we've already heard from the resident tonight, and he has described in I think very moving detail the difficulties that he faces. Um, I think there's a bigger issue here with this um, motion that I'm, uh, the amendment that I'm proposing, and that is the way that we treat disabled people in the inner west local government area. Um, there's a general feeling that disabled parking spaces, and, 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 I, and I got this impression from the report that was written by the officer, that, that an inconvenience, the disabled parking spaces take up too much space and that they, um, uh, and, 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 and from, from other people who deserve a parking space. I think there's also a misconception um, that a parking space must be associated with a vehicle rather than the need for access. And that is what we're talking about with mobility parking spaces. That's actually the word that is used by the RNS or Transport for New South Wales, mobility parking spaces, not disabled parking, because the emphasis should be on mobility, on helping people 
get around, on being able to access their, their transport and being able to um, live their lives and have the same rights as people who are able-bodied. Now, um, the, I, I sent you the, or, or the councillors the link from the RMS um, as to the mobility parking scheme. And it applies to someone who is unable to walk, either permanently. Sorry, Councillor Steer, we've lost you. Or temporarily, um, or because of some permanent condition, cannot, is detrimental as a result, needs to use mobility. Right. Now, that is quite a broad uh, way of, um, of, 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 of allowing people to be disabled, of, 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 of identifying which people should be able to have access to mobility parking spaces. It's quite a lot of broad categories. And in fact, on the um, actually actual application form, Inner West Council itself allows people to put in other reasons that may be persuasive to council. Um, it's not good enough to simply say, oh, somebody objected because he, uh, the resident doesn't have a car anymore and doesn't need to use that space. The resident clearly needs that space in order to access the kind of transport that he needs on a regular basis. And it's also not his space. It doesn't have his name on it. He doesn't own it. Anyone with a disability parking sticker or a mobility parking sticker can actually use that space. And I know that there are other people in that street who do have such stickers and would be able to avail themselves of that space. Mobility parking spaces are not related only to the person who's applied for them. Anyone, Anyone can use them. And therefore, um, that, that is why I am uh, taking this matter so seriously. And, um, and I ask that you all vote for it. Thank you. Thank, thanks very much, Councillor Steer. Uh, uh, as, as indicated, I'm happy to second the adoption of the minutes. Um, uh, I won't actually move a further amendment, but I will we'll just flag in relation to the issue in, at Moody Street. Uh, as has been detailed in the report, the, um, the, the traffic conditions in Moody Street and all of the neighbouring streets around King George Park have been horrendously bad for an extended period now due to West Connect's construction. So I can understand the, the representations from residents seeking to um, maintain whatever protections have been put in place by chance during the construction period. The officers have also identified correctly that what's needed is a local area traffic management plan for that precinct. And in fact, that will be required, not just when the construction phase finishes, but we know that with the government's approval of the Western Harbour Tunnel and the acquisition of the Balmain Leagues Club site, that just 50 metres up the road, there'll then be an even more intense industrial use, um, which all of the residents in that precinct will be impacted by. So um, I, I will be um, tabling a motion at the subsequent meeting to initiate that local area traffic um, management plan. Um, happy to liaise with councillors um, Porteous and Stamoulis in regards to that. I'm sure they'll both already be very familiar. Um, so we need to take a systematic approach to doing everything we can to alleviate um, uh, alleviate those, um, those challenges. And it does need to be addressed for the whole precinct. So I'm happy to table that as a separate motion at the next meeting, or I can see Councillor Porteous look, looking for the call. So it's her preference that I include that as an amendment now, then I'll flag my intention to do that. Councillor Porteous. Uh, yes, look, in regard to uh, Moody Street, I actually think we need to give a little bit more uh, clarity to the residents. I've got a proposed uh, amendment to put to the council, um, which I've had given to the uh, minute taker, and that is that council determines to temporarily continue the no left turn restriction into Victoria Road from Moody Street uh, with the local area traffic management. Excuse me, study. Mr Mayor, I was next to speak. What are we taking other business on for? Oh, sorry, Councillor Passus, I'd missed that. Um, please forgive me. I'll come to you after Councillor Porteous. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I really do appreciate how you chair the meeting. Thank you. 
Do you want me to you continue, me to continue or, 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 or professor? No, it's you. You've got the call. Please oh, proceed. Okay, right. Okay, so um, so I'll just uh, start that again. The, that the council determines to temporarily continue the no left turn restriction into Victoria Road from Moody Street with a local area traffic management study to be undertaken within six months so that a permanent change pending the outcome of the LATM can be considered. I think, I think to leave that unresolved completely is very distressing for the residents. I think if we can say that we are going to continue with the current restriction at this point in time and then work towards this study, um, which will give a more permanent resolution, I think that's probably a better best way to go at this stage because I know there is a lot of distress with the residents currently with the awful uh, traffic situations and parking situations that they're having to endure there. Okay, so thanks for that. that. Yep, thanks for that, Councillor. Well, I'm certainly happy to incorporate it as the seconder. I presume you are as well, Councillor Steer? Yes, 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 okay. I am. Okay, Councillor Porteous, can I ask you if that's already been provided to the minute take? I'll ask has, the minute yeah. to display that amendment which has been incorporated into the primary motion on the screen. Councillor Passus? Mr Mayor, my screen's yes. just frozen, so I can't display anything at the moment. Okay, no problem. We'll come back to you. Councillor Passus? Yes, um, where I sympathise with the resident tonight, um, I have been through what this resident's going through with my husband. And when he goes for rehab, the appropriate uh, organisations come and pick him up and drop him home. Now, we would be setting a precedent here. Um, as Councillor Steer said, anyone can use a dis disabled spot. It's not just designated for that person and that home. Well, we'd have the same problem because you would have somebody else with a disabled sticker parking in that spot. So the resident's transport would still mm -hmm. have to double park to pick him up. Mm -hmm. So it's not addressing the problem. We cannot, um, I see, I'm, I'm going through an issue now about disabled parking. Our, we, we cannot do this because we would have so many more applications coming in just so that the uh, transport can have somewhere to park. And if they do pull up to pick up the patient, and there is another disabled car parking in there, it's the same story again. So uh, in this instance, the officers are correct. This, uh, as I said, we cannot, um, it, it's set in a precedent for everybody that's using mobility uh, organizations. I, I, I sympathize because I'm going through it. I live it. The cars that come and pick my husband up and bring him home. But you can't have a special designated spot just for that. And I'll repeat myself. We know that any car with a disabled sticker can park in the spot. And I'll repeat myself again. What happens when this residence service comes to pick him up and there's already a car in the spot? Chair, if I might speak. Yeah, yeah Councillor Hesse. Thank you, Chair, I appreciate the call. Uh, look, I strong, strongly support Councillor Porteous's motion. We have a history, of course, of giving disability car spaces, but to take Councillor Pass's view of the world, um, we will be ignoring the issue that it's not for the cars, it's for the people. Now, I know Dr O'Brien. I had the pleasure of working with John from 2001 to 2005 at University of New South Wales, and even then, John wouldn't mind me saying he was walking with a walking stick because he was arthritis. John's made a major contribution to our society and particularly interest issues I'm interested in around labour history. He's written histories of the New South Wales Teachers Federation and the National Territory Education Union, as well as, of course, of being an academic in um, work and industrial relations at the University of New South Wales for many years. And he's made civic contributions in broader cultural activities as well and political activities. John's clearly outlined the nature of his illness. Frankly, it wouldn't matter if I knew John or not, although I do, and I have the greatest respect for him and the greatest sadness to hear of his illnesses. But what are we to use disability parking for if we're not going to help the most disabled? 
I, I really encourage your counsellors to say, well, yes, this, of course, is what it's for. And I don't blame the staff. I mean, the staff get, uh, you know, what, we, what we're doing is we are interpreting the rules to give them guidance. We are the community's representatives here. And I do hope that all of us will say, and, and you know, I'm sympathetic to Councillor Passes. I'd say, yep, great. If, if Councillor Passes' family members are in a similar situation, great, let's help her in the same, exactly the same way as we should be helping John O'Brien at this terrible time um, to make life just that little bit better where we can. So I do hope everyone supports Councillor Porteous's motion. Thank you. Just okay, to just for clarity, Councillor Steer is the mover of the motion. The Porteous Amendment has been incorporated on the second of the motion. Councillor Stamoulis. Thank you. Uh, Mr Mayor, I have two amendments that hopefully will appear on screen. I just want to make sure that one of them is consistent with uh, Councillor Porteous's um, amendment. Um, so my item one should be consistent, I think. Um, oh, sorry, my item two... Uh, yeah, it should be consistent with one, uh, with, the, with uh, Councillor Porteous. And my, uh, my first amendment is saying that I think we should start early. Our residents are getting very concerned and there's a lot of uncertainty in that area at the moment. And I think the sooner that we start some initial consultation uh, with, with our residents, just mapping out concepts and thoughts about what our residents would need would allure, would uh, uh, um, stop a lot of the concern that that is occurring there at the moment. So I'm saying let's open up some initial dialogue now, which will incorporate both the Iron Cove link, it will incorporate the uh, Tiger site changes, but open up that consultation now, some of the expectations, some of the concept uh, work can be done earlier on. So that's my point one. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Stamos. I think both of your points are um, redundant. So Councillor Porteous's amendment has stated that the no left turn from Moody Street into Victoria Road would be maintained. Um, and th then she's also proposed and it's been accepted into the primary motion that a local area traffic study be undertaken. I, I suppose if we wanted to be absolutely clear, we could further amend that to say a local area uh, traffic management study for the precinct be undertaken. And at, at that point, if that were incorporated, then it, for certain, your amendments are redundant. They're, they're identical to Councillor Porteous's for all intents and purposes. Now, so, does the, yeah. Mr. Mayor? Yeah. Does the LATM include significant consultation in that? Yes, it does. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Um, further discussion, councillors? There's no further discussion. I'll go to Councillor yeah, Steer for the right of reply. Chair, I'll just chime in and just say something. I think yeah. what it highlights is um, a difficulty in how we assess um, disabled parking permits. There's a number of challenges in that, particularly when people even have parking spots on their properties and they can't really access them and staff uh, are challenged to actually give them spots. And I think... It's incumbent for that policy to be a little bit more flexible when it's backed up with medical um, medical reports where doctors have actually consulted with the patient and identified conditions which make it difficult for them, whether they're stairs from the, the back or whether the spot's too small and you can't open the car door for them properly to access. I might be moving something along those lines in future meetings, but... I am buoyed by all of the attention to the impacts of West Connex and, and residents around the area. And I think it's good that council is actually moving on these things and alleviating the issues. I'm sure the residents of Chandos Street are looking down now and thinking they're in a great council right now. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much for that, Councillor Macri. So I'll go to Councillor Steer for a right of reply. Uh Thank you, Mayor. Um, I don't need to make this very long. I think I've 
made the message very clear that we need to consider disabled parking and the rights of disabled pe people in our LGA. It was about go get spaces to add accessibility into that. And, uh, and, and the motion that I'm putting now is, is actually consistent with that because it's recognising the needs of other people. Um, and uh, the we do need to um, think more closely about what constitutes disability and how we can help people with disability. I had brief for, for a while, um, as you know, a minor disability myself due to an illness. And I can tell you now that Stanmore in particular is a very hilly place when you're, when you're walking with a cane and uh, can be almost impossible if, um, if, if you have more disabilities than that. And we need to be able to help people um, access, have, have the same rights as everybody else to go to the shop, to get in and out of their house and, and to access the services that they need um, easily and effectively. Uh, so I hope you all vote for this motion. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for that, Councillor Steer. I'll now put the motion. All those in favour, please raise your hands. In support, I have Councillors Stamilis, De Cruz, Hesse, Macri, Kiat, Lockie, Porteous, Iskander, York, Steer. And myself, Councillor McKenna is um, absent at this moment. All those against? Councillor Passis is against. That has been carried. Which brings us to the next item, item six, Nat National General Assembly of Local Government. Now, councillors, I know there's amendments and I have one that I wish to table myself. Before we get to that, you'll all, we do need to deal with the issue of councillors attending the National General of As Assembly of Local Government. As you recall, we deferred this matter previously because we wanted to seek clarification about whether, um, whether there would be an in-person conference to attend. And we've now received that information that, the, um, that ALGA is encouraging councillors to attend in person. And so to that end, I propose that council um, nominate councillors to attend the National General Assembly of Local Government. And uh, as per Councillor Passis's suggestion previously, it's just simpler to do that now in a public forum rather than to ask councillors subsequently. So I'll put my hand, hand up as mayor. I intend to, um, to go to the National Assembly. And can I just ask all other councillors who um, would like to attend like to raise their hands hand. so that we can list them now. Councillor Byrne, I'd like to go. Councillor yeah, Lockie. Just, so yeah, just if everyone who, who's intending to go can raise their hands, I'll go through and list the names. So I have councillors to cruise. Yeah. Hesse. Councillor Byrne, I can't. Uh, yes. Councillor Byrne, I can't actually um, raise my hand because my video has been locked by the host. Uh, okay. So, this do you, do you wish to attend? Here, so I do wish to attend. Okay. So I have councillors, I'll just start again. I have councillors De Cruz, Hesse, Lockie, Iskander, Steer, myself. Is there anyone else? Okay, so that becomes part of the primary motion, or that is the primary motion. And then I'll suggest that we deal with further um, motions to be tabled for the, for the National as as General Assembly as amendments. To that end, I will move the primary motion and, and also move an amendment, which I'll now speak to. I'll ask the minute takers to, Mr. I'll ask Catherine to display the amendment that I've just forwarded to her on the screen. Are we voting? Are we voting on the attendance? We will be, yes. Catherine, are you able to display my amendment, which I forwarded to you on the screen? I'm just getting it ready now. Oh, thanks very much. Are you able to display it so that people are able to see the, the motion in its... Um, on one page. Okay, 
Thanks very much, Catherine. So, councillors, as you'll be aware, the federal government has recently announced changes to the job seeker payment, which was previously the job keeper payment, uh, which was previously the new start payment. You'll all be aware that there's been a thing called the coronavirus supplement, which was aimed at increasing the um, increasing the rate of um, payment to unemployed Australians throughout the pandemic and the economic crisis. That is being wound back on the 30th of March. The government until recently had been yet to identify what the, what the new payment rate would be. And they've recently made an announcement that they'll be increasing, they'll be decreasing the rate very significantly from that which was contained within the coronavirus supplement. And instead, it will equate to a $3.57 per day increase on the previous rate of new start. Councillors will also be aware that, um, that the rate of new start had not increased for 25 years, uh, which was just extraordinary, leaving a country such as ours, a, a very developed and wealthy Western nation with one of the lowest rates of income for unemployed people of, of any country in the developed world. Um, I think it's important that we recognise that political attitudes in other parts of the country are, are very different to that in the inner west. But one thing that unites all local government representatives is that we all represent communities in which poverty is a serious problem, particularly in regional and rural communities. Uh, we know that the disparities between communities such as ours and the, um, the levels of poverty experienced in those places is, is very large. But we also know that even in very affluent, fortunate places such as the inner west and in the metropolitan communities, there's still um, huge numbers of local citizens who are experiencing poverty on a daily basis. So to that end, I think a, a useful step that the inner west council can take is to propose to the government, uh, to the National General Assembly, a, a position that can be supported by local government representatives regardless of their geography or of their political persuasion. So what I'm proposing here is a motion which won't necessarily represent the, the, the strongest policy position that the NOS Council has already adopted in regards to um, the rate of job seeker. I, I'm seeking to propose something that could maximise the number of delegates to the National General Assembly who will vote in support of it, thereby maximising the pressure on the federal government to raise the rate to something that order. is... Point of order. Point of order. To raise... Sorry, Councillor Passas, what's your point of order? I have a point of order. Yep. This is entirely different to us voting on who's attending the conference. Then we go on to um, discuss what we're submitting to the conference. Yeah, and we're going to vote. So I'll just address that point of order, Councillor Passas. We're going to vote on the... Um, we're going to vote on the on each of the motions as an amendment. So, if you wish to vote against any of the motions, you'll be able to, and you'll still Not be able to vote. Motion. We need to vote who is attending the conference. We will and be voting on that. That's the sorry, Councillor Passis. If you stop interjecting, I'll explain to you the process. There's a primary motion which I've moved, which is on the screen, which you can read, which reads as follows: that Council nominate Councillors Byrne, Lockie, De Cruz, Hesse, Steer, and Iskander to attend the National General Assembly of Local Government Conference. That's the primary motion. Point, the, the rest of the points that will follow will be voted on separately as amendments to the primary motion. I don't think I can explain it any more clearly than that. Um, given you've interjected, um, I, I won't speak to the motion further. Sorry, given you've moved to point of order and I've had to discontinue my um, speaking to the motion, I'll just read the motion so that there's clarity about what we're voting on. And it reads as follows. Can I just ask that it's all displayed on the screen, the, the amendment that I'm moving? Thank you. Um, that the federal government's revised rate of job seeker payment of $44 per day is inadequate and will result in millions of Australian citizens being unnecessarily trapped in poverty after 25 years with no increase to the incomes of unemployed Australians, an increase of just $3.57 per day above the previous rate of new start payment is insufficient. And the National General... No, it's not the National General Assembly. It's the council right to all mayors and councillors throughout Australia requesting that their councils adopt this resolution and request that it be tabled at the National Assembly 
of local government. So I, I will move that way. Um, now, Councillor Lockie has also flagged that she has a motion that she wishes to um, wishes to put, which can also be dealt with as an amendment. I'm just trying to do this as neatly as possible. Are there other councillors who also have motions that they wish to table? No? Okay. I'm going to ask if there's a seconder for my amendment and then I'm going to go to... And, and Happy to second that, Councillor Byrne. Councillor Hesse. Seconded by Councillor Hesse. Um, I suppose I was going to go to Councillor Lockie to, to propose her motion, but I suppose the proper course of action is to debate the, the first motion first. So I will come to you, Councillor Lockie. Councillor Hesse, do you wish to speak to the amendment? Oh, look, we're going to be here all night. I strongly support the amendment. It's a great idea. Thanks, Councillor Byrne. And um, I look forward to prosecuting this um, with great support down in Canberra. Can I just make one comment? Can I um, encourage our delegates to have a look at the $80 a day campaign um, with respect to job seeker unemployment payments generally, and perhaps move that as an amendment? I agree with Councillor Burns general approach to try and seek the widest possible support for this, but I think it would be worth putting up um, that particular proposal that is gaining uh, a lot of momentum. Okay, thanks very much for that. There's no further discussion on that amendment, the motion in regards to job seeker. I'll put that, all those in favour, raise your hands. In support, I have councillors McKenna, Stamoulis, De Cruz, Hesse, Kiat, Lockie, Iskander, York, Steer, and myself. All those against? Against, I have councillors Passus. Councillor Macri, are you for or against the motion? For. Councillor Macri is for. The only councillor against is Councillor Passus. That has been carried. That amendment is incorporated into the primary motion. Councillor Lockie? Yes, uh, so thank you for that. I circulated um, the motion I'd like to <laughs> forward uh, earlier today. It's just in relation to the, the Racism Not Welcome campaign. I think it's pretty self-explanatory that it, the first point is just designed to um, note the origin and the purpose of the campaign and how it's targeted at local councils. Second one just encourages all councils attending the NGA, to in, uh, all councils around Australia to endorse it. And the third one calls for the federal action, which is to express grave concern at the rise of racism in Australia and request funding be made available to councils to support the rollout. I don't think this should be terribly controversial given it reflects the adopted position of uh, our own council on the racism not welcome campaign and I'd just like to again thank fellow councillors for their support on this um, obviously our council was the first to to pioneer it in November with the inner west multicultural network uh, since then Waverley council and city of Sydney have both um, endorsed it Cumberland council are due to consider it next week I believe a further, as of last week, a further 43 councils around Australia have requested the toolkit that, to help guide them with the implementation of the campaign in their own communities. So it really is um, a grassroots success story and I'm very proud that it started in our own community. Yes, may I speak? Just one moment, Councillor. I'll second the amendment from Councillor Lockie. Uh, I'll refrain from speaking. Councillor Passus? Yes, um... As a person that's, in, that's 70, that uh, was born post-war, I would like to ask a question if I could put it through you to Councillor Lockie. In the entire term time of on this term, has Councillor Lockie supported any resident subject of racism taunts to the Anti-Discrimination Board? In fact, has any councillor on this council um, supported any resident with a complaint where they've been um, had race and racist taunts against them. I, my mother, my, mother, my, late, my mother, late mother, my sisters and I grew up at a time where there was no laws, there was no discrimination laws. It was so difficult. We changed it. People like us changed what is going on. And I find it a bit rich 
that somebody's coming up now with all the laws in place. I'm waiting for an answer. Has any councillor helped a resident that's come to them or that they're aware of, they must be aware to be putting this motion up that this is happening. Have they supported the person, the subject of the taunts? Have they helped them lodge complaints? See, it's all right to stand under signs and have photos taken, but it's, it's not good to depict our area as a bunch of rednecks, Ku Klux Klan, raging right wingers, point of order. when it is just not true. It is point not true. Right. We've got a point of order from Councillor Lockie. I would ask uh, Councillor Passis to withdraw that comment. I believe she's casting aspersions at, that um, are, are basically saying things that are not true and implying that councillors are holding views about our residents that we do not and have never stated. Yeah, thank you for that. Now, Councillor Passes, I hadn't had a chance to put any question to any councillor because you'd continue to speak, so I assumed the clock's actually not running. I can't see it at the moment, but I assumed that you were continuing your speech and that was a rhetorical device. But if you are putting that question, I'm going to rule that out of order. It's not relevant, oh. to, it's not relevant to the motion. And I will ask you to withdraw the, um, the uh, statement that you made that councillors were depicting residents as being members of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, oh, with... I said our council is being depicted, our council area is being depicted as members of Ku Klux Klan, yeah. raging Passes, right wing. Councillor Passis, I'll call you to order. I'd asked you to withdraw. Um, you've restated the, the assertion rather than withdrawing, so I'll warn you. I'll ask you to desist from making... Uh, those assertions and if you'd like to conclude your remarks by addressing the motion please do. Mr Mayor you only have to look around our municipality to see the restaurants you only you cannot buy pie and three veg in the inner west just have a look at our ethnic restaurant just look how how well we are getting on when I was growing up I had to hide my food I could not eat garlic the day before I went to work or I would be picked on. Now they're buying garlic tablets. Do not depict our municipality as racist because we are not. I would like anybody that's been subject of racist taunts and if any councillor knows about it, that's supporting all this, do something about it. Take the people on, have them prosecuted. Councillors are very good at going after people when it suits them. Now, I am just saying, I am getting so much feedback from ethnics, from Asians. What does that sign mean? Why was it put up? It makes us look terrible. It makes us look like a bad municipality. Why is it there? Look at our council. Look how many councillors we have of ethnic backgrounds. I was part of changing things. I was part of that. Ethnics, 30, 40, 50 years ago, that's when signs would have went up, but they didn't. And to bring this up now and to be taking up council's time and depicting our area as a bunch of races, I will not accept it. Okay. Just a couple of issues before we move on. Firstly, it is quite difficult with the, um, probably nothing that can be done about this. Most of the time, I can't see whether the clock is actually, appears to me to be paused. So it's very difficult for me to rule on when councillors have concluded speaking. So Catherine, is there anything that's able to be done about that? Are you not able to see the clock at all? Most of the time it's frozen on, like it might be frozen on two minutes and 33 seconds. Um, and then it might reappear subsequently as being down to zero, but it's impossible. I, I'm not able to see it because it's not actually running down. It may just be my device, but it, it makes it very difficult to keep people to time. So I, I don't imagine there's any easy solution to that, but I'll just flag that so that everybody can be, I'll ask Catherine to look at it and see whether it can be addressed and everyone else to be patient with me in the meantime. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, it is freezing. It has been freezing on certainly on my device as well. So I think it's some it's some glitch in the system. Yeah. Mm. Thank you for that. Um, uh, 
And then separate to that, this is an unrelated matter, but I, I've just been notified by a resident that um, that the council is live, the council account is live tweeting the proceedings in relation to uh, the, the matter that we discussed in Summer Hill where we resolved a particular position. There's a tweet that's gone out that's linking to a site that says no more boarding houses for Summer Hill, which is not reflective of the adopted position of the council. And I'll just ask the council officers to address that by deleting that tweet or removing the link. Um, uh, further discussion, councillors? Councillor Byrne, can I? Councillor Hesse. Yeah, look, I just wish to speak very briefly in favour of um, Councillor Lockie's motion. Um, in fact, I, I would say that the, the signs we've erected already in Council are receiving a very, very positive response. They have elicited some debate on the local Facebook pages I'm aware of, which is in the form of Marrickville LGA. And um, yep, there are a couple of people out there who have reviews, have views which aren't that great, but by and large, it's actually seen a very positive response. I've had shared with me um, responses uh, as I understand the motion's being proposed or has been put to Cumberland Council, um, former parts of the former Granville, uh, the former uh, Auburn and Granville areas. And that some of the, the, the mail received by councillors of Asian background there I won't read it because it's it's gut wrenchingly awful and vilely racist. This is in the city in which we live, and so I think this. I, I, I also grew up in regional New South Wales. The, you know, frankly, the racism against Aboriginal people, which still exists, we see it in our in our jail in, in our jail system. We see it everywhere. is is ongoing and shocking. And I think signs like this play the part of provoking people to think about it. Putting it up acknowledges that it's real. It may not be you or it may not be anyone on this broadcast, on this meeting tonight, and I hope it isn't, but it's out there and it's real. And challenging that at, at, at a body like the Australian Local Government Association is a good thing. And I have to say, my attendance a couple of years ago was very, very positive, and I found that having those discussions with councillors from around the country was was really interesting. And I have to say, the discussion of community leaders from around this country was a good deal more sensible than I often see <laughs> in reports of federal politics. So I think this is a discussion which I think is really important. And I think it's great that Councillor Lockie has shared with us already. There are so many councillors taking this up. So. Oh, look, I think this is going to be a great discussion in Canberra. And I think it, it will, in its own way, put pressure back on other levels of government to take, to follow the lead of local government, frankly. So I would hope all councillors support this. Thank you. Can I also briefly speak in support of this? I just want to congratulate Councillor Lockie on taking this to um, the National Assembly, um, a great success in our own area and something that does deserve attention on a national stage, as Councillor Hesse has mentioned. I'll just briefly note that a, a Scanlon survey that was reported in The Guardian noted that, um, sadly, um, uh, in November 2020, 44% of respondents to the survey said they had ne very negative or somewhat negative feelings towards Chinese Australians, which was a nearly threefold increase from seven years previous. That's huge um, and for me as a Chinese Australian that's not great um, and there was reports of a councillor in Cumberland receiving death threats for um, his purported contribution to the COVID pandemic so it is very timely um, and I'll only say that um, in response to Councillor Pastor's question I've only had one resident contact me about um, receiving uh, discrimination and abuse in this area and um, I did refer him to um, the anti-discrimination board and he was successful in his complaint so um, there was that story I think Councillor Pass is familiar with it. Okay thank you for that clarification. Further discussion councillors? Yes I, maybe I can add an I think Councillor Scanlon wanted to speak. 
I add an amendment. Maybe we should put the right, no racism yeah. sign up in the council. Point of order. Yes, council so Passes has spoken. Sorry. That's the Sorry, only racism I've Sorry, seen is in our council chambers. Sorry, Councillor Passes. I'll, I'll call you to order. You have inject you you have interjected multiple times tonight. You've already been warned. Um, I, I will warn you again. Raise my hand. If I you would like to speak. Yes, I'm coming to you, Councillor Escander. Councillor Passes, I, I will warn you a second time if you continue to interject. Councillor Escander. Thank you. First, I would like to thank very much Councillor Lucky for putting this forward. I do believe in it. I had uh, a few incidents happen in the inner west. Two of them were reported. One was against a Chinese man. It was on the uh, television. And the other one, it was in a kindergarten. Uh, the, the mother is one of our uh, young citizens of the year. And she is very famous. I don't want to mention the names, but her daughter was subject to a real racism because of her black color. Uh, that's to start with. But when we talk about Hansenism, when we talk about the attacks uh, on Sudanese, Sudanese, when we attack, uh, we talk about uh, conflicts happened in Newcastle or in some pocket area around Bankstown, around uh, Fairfield, against that area, it means it is really serious. And we have to work together to make what we did in the past, which was something we have very proud of. We created the multiculturalism and we made it very successful. That means we can continue in that path. And I must say, I am very proud uh, to be Australian, treated the way I, I am very happy with and everyone like that. But it doesn't mean I myself wasn't subject to very different, uh, if you like, aspects of the racism or discrimination. It happened, I talk, I have evidence, and one, one day, one day, I'm gonna publish my book about a walk living in Australia. Mm. That's to conclude with, I support, and I urge everyone to support. <laughs> Well, I think we can all agree that that will be a very interesting story to read. I look forward to reading it, Councillor Iskander. Further discussion, okay. councillors? Mr Mayor. Yes, Councillor Stamos. Uh, Mr Mayor, the only question that I'll put to Councillor Lockie, if I can, is uh, that in relation to 3B. Um, my thought there is that um, I, I wouldn't like councils across the nation to make their response contingent on whether they got um, funding from uh, funding from the uh, federal government. That, that is that it would be nice if points one and two were uh, followed through that the councils did it themselves. Uh, but if some sat back and said, oh, we'll do this only if we get uh, some funding, that could affect the, um, the, a good solid response rate. So I'm wondering, would, would Councillor Lockie think that the expense was too high? Uh, because I thought it was re reasonably accessible, the spending, so therefore you may not need to seek funding and would we be better off maybe not making it contingent on, on B, that is federal funding, and just say, councils, go ahead and do it? Put that question to Councillor Lockie. Look, that's not the way the motion is actually written. Essentially what it... it 
the points one and two stand on their own. Point three is to request that federal funding be made available to support councils to implement the campaign because, yes, obviously it's designed as a grassroots campaign for councils to do it themselves, but the more financing you have, the bigger you can make it and the more you can do. So it is essentially requesting that they... It's putting the request in, but it's not making endorsement or involvement or support of the campaign contingent on receiving that federal funding. Yeah. Thank you for that. Is there any further discussion, councillors? If not, I'll put the Lockie Byrne Amendment. All those in favour, please raise your hands and keep them raised. In support, I have councillors McKenna, Stamilis, De Cruz, Hesse, Macri, Lockie, Iskander, Steer, Kiat, York. De Cruz and myself. All those against? Councillor Passis is against. That has been carried. Are there, there's no further motions to be tabled, so we're now dealing with the primary motion. The primary motion has both Councillor Lockie's motion and mine um, incorporated. So the primary motion is now to nominate the, the aforementioned councillors to be delegates to the National Assembly of Local Government and to submit those two motions for consideration. Uh, I, I'm the mover of the primary motion. Is there a seconder for the primary motion? I'll second. Seconded by Councillor Lockie. I'll uh, waive my right of reply. I'll put that motion. All those in favour, please. Uh, Sorry, are we, talk, are we able to speak to that primary motion? Uh, yes, well, I think, yes, according to the Code of Meeting Practice, we could debate it, but we've debated both and voted on both of the amendments, so we would simply be debating the, um, the, the motion to identify delegates to go to the conference. Well, well that's correct, Mr Mayor, and, and this is where I, I ask at the previous meeting specifically whether or not um, we could find out, because we know that, that a number of those councils are very concerned uh, about the COVID environment. In fact, we're one of the remaining councils in the nation right now uh, still having Zoom meetings because of the high uh, concern that our council has uh, about the COVID uh, situation. Um, now, did we find out whether or not our councillors can attend by Zoom? That's my question. Thank you. Uh, it's addressed in the, in the report, Councillor Stamilis, and I did address this in my uh, uh, opening comments, but I'll ask the council, I'll ask the general manager to um, to speak to that. Through the chair, Alga um, advised today that they're looking at technology um, for voting delegates to be able to attend via Zoom, but they don't have any, any information on that yet. And what ruling, what ruling will, will, given that given we... That we uh, our current environment, Mr Mayor, what ruling will we make? Will it be Zoom? Uh, because all of our meetings and briefings are currently Zoom. Because, because you're... I can see it. Excuse me, sorry. Councillor Stamos, the, the advice from ALGA is that... Sorry, excuse me, I know this puts Councillor Passos off I'm making the mistake of just finishing a mouthful of food. Um, the advice from ALGA is that they're encouraging members, they're encouraging delegates to attend in person and they're continuing to assess what options they'll be able to undertake for people to be able to participate remotely. Well, so, our, there's not a health authority, uh, Mr Mayor. We make our decisions uh, for the risk oh. and safety of our council. Yeah, I'm sorry. What's the question, Councillor? I'm not a health authority either. So what, what's well, the question that you're putting? My question is, Mr Mayor, all of our meetings and briefings are currently via Zoom. That is our policy. It's a very strict policy. That's um, a statement. We are about to move a motion about attendance of six councillors. It is, uh, is it under our current policy of Zoom or is it under a different policy? I, I'm, I, look, to be frank, Councillor Stamilis, that is most of that's a statement and the question is nonsensical. We are not the body that... that oh, point of order, Mr Mayor, point of order. We have a strict policy of Zoom meetings. We don't have a strict policy of directing ALGA or other bodies about how they'll conduct their conferences because we have no delegation to do so. But if the option is open to Zoom, then that's consistent with our policy. 
that's a statement. I'm still confused as to what your question is. So yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm you are, sorry. I'm welcome. Welcome. Yeah, to the substantive motion, I might be able to add something for councillors Tamilis's benefit. Yeah. But yeah, we could just get on with it and vote vote on it. But okay, yeah. Councillor Hesse is volunteering to answer the question from Councillor Sam. I would like oh, to no, answer the question, but I'm I'm going to say that um, no, yesterday I, didn't put it, I did not put the question to Councillor Hesse, did I? Yesterday, I'm contributing to the debate, Councillor Stamless, and uh, like I, I, can, I can assure I can assure okay. councillors that uh, that indeed that we are attending council meetings face to face. Uh, I know that the general manager selection panel has met face to face twice and it's been a I'm going to call the meeting to order. Thing. Thank you. I'll call the meeting to order. Councillor Stamos, I'm sorry I'm not able to keep up with the with the sophistication of your question so I don't know how to answer them. And I'm now going to put the motion. Mr Mayor, I would like to speak. Uh, sorry Councillor sorry Councillor Passis we, we've already concluded the debate. We were about to move I, I'd waive my right of reply. Mr Mayor, I would like to speak. I have a right. I'm an elected councillor. But we've already moved beyond that. No, you have life. not, Mr. Mayor. You have yeah. not moved beyond that. Okay, Councillor Passis, over to you. Thank you very much. We are voting on at least three or four councillors. <laughs> biggest problems with meetings via Zoom. It, tonight is just one case of what we're going through. And we've got councillors that do not want to meet physically, that are ready to go down and meet and greet councillors, by the way, at least three or four that are not standing for re-election. We do not know how much this is costing. I have a motion on, on a very serious traffic issue, and I'm told that the money is too expensive in a report. You must nominate this funding, have we voted on this funding? How much, we don't even know how much this is going to cost. We have residents that want to attend council. We have residents that want democratically run meetings and we have not been doing it. Tonight via Zoom, we've had about seven, eight different things come up at the 11th hour. How democratic is this council? This is totally unacceptable. And I would like some answers. How much is this going to cost for these councillors to attend? And if they can attend the conference in Canberra, why can they not attend a council meeting? Have you concluded your remarks, Councillor Passus? Thank you. Yes, I have. Okay. I'll put Councillor Passus's question to the um, council officers and I'll add the question in regards to how attendance at the National Assembly of Local Government relates to Council's existing policies. Is there provision within the existing policies of Council for councillors to um, be able to attend local government conferences? Uh, through the Chair, um, the, the advice or guidance that is provided in relation to Council meetings um, is provided in response to the current health advice uh, provided by the New South Wales Department of Health and responds to the risks that are potentially present in having um, councillors um, and or members of the public present in council meetings. Um, that advice is regularly updated and councillors who have contacted me about that would be well aware that we have reviewed that on a, on, on a quite a regular basis and, uh, and that health advice um, has been taken into account in each of those situations. As far as a meeting is concerned in another jurisdiction altogether, i.e. Canberra, um, we have absolutely no uh, capacity to advise councillors or to restrict the organisation that provides um, a, a conference such as this in, in relation to whether they meet in person or, uh, or meet via Zoom. Okay, follow up question. Could I have a follow-up question? So the other councils that are meeting physically are breaching the health rules. I put that question to the general manager. Through the chair. Um, there are a variety of approaches that are, have been taken by different councils. Uh, some have never, ever responded to the health advice and have continued to uh, meet in person. 
they are by far in a mi minority. The majority of councils have adopted either a Zoom approach or a mixed um, in-person and Zoom approach. Um, as, as I've stated earlier, we review this almost every three or four weeks um, and we will review it again as soon as there is an update on the health advice and we will inform councillors of the outcome of that review. Well, Mr General Manager, thanks for that. But if I could just uh, say that the Minister... No, I'm sorry, Councillor out. Passes. Sorry, Councillor Passes. No, the, no, sorry, Councillor Passes. You won't be able minister. to say anything because you've concluded your remarks. Did you have the, a further the question that you wish to ask? Yes, yes. So our council did not see, receive the directive from the Minister that councillors should be meeting physically at, unless they have a good reason why they only can attend by Zoom. And I'll that put that question to the, I'll that put that started question, in March. I'll call the meeting to order. I'll put that question to the general manager and then Councillor Passes, as this is not um, relevant to the motion that we're adopting, I'm going to call, uh, call an end to that line of questioning after the general manager answers this question. Uh, through the chair, I'm unaware of that directive, but I'm quite happy to investigate it further and advise. Okay. Thank you for that. There's no further discussion. I'll now put the primary motion. All those in favour, please raise your hands and keep them raised. In support, I have councillors McKenna, Stamoulis, Hesse, Macri, Lockie, Iskander, Porteous, De Cruz, Kiat, York, Steer, and myself. Uh, sorry, Councillor De Cruz, are you in support of the motion? Councillor De Cruz, are you there? Yes, I'm in support. Okay, thank you. And all those against? Councillor Passas is against. That has been carried. That brings us next, councillors, to... How did Councillor Stamolas vote on that? He voted in, in support. Okay. That, that brings us next, I think, to item 10, insurance claim processing system. Now, councillors, I'm going to propose a motion that we defer consideration of this to receive... Sorry, what happened um, to item eight? It's been adopted. Oh, my God. No, it wasn't. I objected to that. I have an amendment. No, it was definitely adopted. It wasn't, but anyway. It, it was adopted. I'm sorry, Councillor. So I, second, that I second your motion, Mayor, to defer this. This needs more investigation. Okay. Can I just... I, I know I'm a very deficient chair, but could I just ask everyone to just give me a little bit more cooperation at 10 o'clock at night with, a, 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 with, with fewer interjections so that I can try to make sure that we can deal with the business? Uh, up to item 10, Council's Insurance Claim Processing System, I think um, all councillors have an interest in this. The, the, the piece of data that I, I think is, is, that is relevant and that we need is to understand what the trends are within the Inner West Council over recent years in regards to the assessment and the awarding of claims. So to that end, Catherine, have I forwarded you the, the, um, the wording for the amendment that I was proposing already? No, Mayor, I haven't received that. Okay. Well, I, I, I'll ask you, I'm sorry to, be, to get into this practice. As you know, I, I try to be very disciplined about making sure that councillors are not dictating um, motions to you because it's such a difficult thing to, to deal with. But if I can ask you just to further amend the wording that you've got on the screen so that it would read, the council defer consideration of this item to the April ordinary meeting. Thank you. Um, uh, and that um, data on... Um, uh, uh, data on the assessment claims. and uh, awarding of claims. Okay, I think that's sufficient. Thanks very much, Catherine. Councillor Passes has indicated her willingness to second the motion. Okay. Now, councillors, we can have a big, long debate about insurance, but is there anyone who wishes to amend or move a foreshadowed motion? Because if not, we're going to have that debate next month anyway with more information. So it, it might be better just to, to deal with the motion for deferral and not have the debate. Councilor Is there Brown, anyone who wants to move a foreshadowed motion? I only want to propose an amendment so that we can get some additional um, category of information. Yep. We get Please proceed. Um, I've 
provided the wording to to the minute taker i hope by email um yeah so i don't mean this to be contrary but i um think that when we get this deferred report back that we also should understand why this service was outsourced now i did miss the um the q a or the briefing at 5 p.m today and that might have been addressed there but i want to understand why um this part of uh, this previously in-house operation was outsourced yeah uh, councillor yep yeah, so without speaking to it at length councillor cat i share your concern but my understanding from being briefed by the general manager today is that there has been no outsourcing it, it was always something that was conducted externally but if I invite him to provide that explanation now, we're going to have a lengthy debate about this. So could I, le could I lean on you to agree that we'll incorporate your amendment. Um, that will be part of the April report, but we won't have the debate now. We'll just move on to the next item. Are you satisfied with that, Councillor Piat? Very. Okay. That's incorporated into the primary motion, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Passus. All those in favour? All those against? I think that's carried unanimously. Does anyone wish to be recorded voting against the, the motion? No? Excellent. That is carried unanimously. We'll move on to item 11, notice of motion, Yabsley Avenue, Ashfield. Councillor Kiat. I'll wave my right, and uh, I thought the resident spoke to this and explained the issue quite clearly. Um, so uh, I'm advised by officers that, um, that this meeting can occur and, um, uh, yeah, we'll receive more information when it does. Thank you. I'll second the motion. Councillor Passis, you were the only councillor who wished to bring this forward. Yes, um, I just want to, um, through you to the uh, officers, seeing that this, um, these changes that came come about from Canterbury Council and the GA process they're going through, apart from sort of sitting down and talking to them, our officers and mediation, do we have any other recourse? I don't think we have, do we? Uh, through, through the, uh, yeah, no, go ahead. Apart from um, us trying to sit down with dialogue, uh, with the, um, how will this work? Do we make representation on behalf of our residents and how, what, what type of representation? To, through the chair, um, I, I've spoken to the um, general manager of uh, Canterbury Bankstown City Council and um, he has agreed to make available an officer from that council to consult uh, and engage with our residents to explain the rationale for the development as proposed. Um, I've indicated that um, I would make one of our officers available to simply listen, um, but you're quite right in making your observation that um, uh, there is no practical uh, or legal uh, capacity for council to assist other than to, um, uh, to, to allow them to, to speak to the officers. Uh, thank you, uh, Brian, for that, because I've had other residents raise other issues to do with this development on our side of the, uh, uh, of the area. And could the officer, our officer that is going to uh, speak to them, could he sort of get back to us with some sort of very, very small report like the outcome of it and what's happening? Uh, I'm, I'm sure a record of the meeting will be, um, uh, will be taken. Thank, thank you. Okay, I'll put the motion. All those in favour, against, declare that carried unanimously, I presume. Is there anyone who wishes to be recorded voting against it? That has been carried unanimously. I'll just ask the minute takers to, Catherine, to remind me, was, Item 12 carried in block? Yes, it was. Okay. Item 13, odour control unit in Walleye Creek. Councillor Porteous? Yes, look, I'll just speak briefly to this uh, because Peter Stevens, I think, outlined it very well early this evening. This is basically a motion of solidarity and to put some more pressure on the state government uh, not to locate this odour unit right in the middle of the park particularly uh, because it's also threatening the Two Valley Trail. Um, this is a highly valued park in an urban uh, context which is very well um, frequented. It's, it's very popular um, and a lot of our inner west residents use it as well 
And I think it's important that we, uh, when it's a threat like this, that we um, do what we can to try and ensure that this odour unit is not located uh, in the park as is being proposed. So I hope councillors will support this motion. I'm happy to second that if I can. Do you wish to speak to it, councillor? Very briefly. Um, I live in South America. This is a very highly used, um, as Councillor Porty said, part of the Two Valley Trail, which is the Cooks River Valley to the Wallow Creek Valley. Um, it's highly used by residents, particularly in the ward I represent, but more broadly indeed, because as Peter Stevens said, this is one of this is you know essentially the last sort of remnant bushland in the sort of inner southwest area of Sydney. There is an opportunity. Uh, and this is something Wallow Creek Preservation Society has been pushing for years, there's, there's an opportunity rather than putting the odour control unit above is to put it next to, to where the, the situation is now and it would actually solve all the problems. I, 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 without being nasty about it, I do think there's a little bit of um, bureaucratic resistance to just doing something which is rather obvious. And I do hope that all councillors support this. I recognise that while it's not in our LGA, it's something that affects people in our LGA and um, as Councillor Porty said, it is a solidarity thing. Um, and um, I think would add weight to the cause of, of good people. I know there's many members of, members of the Wallow Creek Preservation Society in, in Marrickville and Tempe and, and Dulwich Hill. And um, I think it will just um, put a bit of pressure on the government to, uh, just to do just an easy right, right, right thing. Thank cool. you. Is there any further discussion, councillors? If not, I'll put the motion. All those in favour, please raise your hands. Keep them raised. Is there anyone who's against the motion? No, I'll declare that carried unanimously. Item 14, Councillor Kiat. Thanks, Councillor Byrne. Um, I think uh, um, most of you will be familiar with the Greenway Steering Committee and the important role that they play and have played for uh, many, many years in the development and implementation of the project. Um, and I think even when all of the construction is completed, they will still play a very important role in the management of um, this um, uh, very, very large and complicated and um, unique project uh, that has won so many awards as a result of the hard work of many of the members of that committee, as well as um, many uh, of our staff, current and, and previous. Um, hopefully you have read the letter from the Greenway Steering Committee chaired yeah. by um, Alex Lofts. And uh, this proposal seeks to support um, uh, what the, uh, the Greenway Steering Committee is asking council to do, um, which is one, um, maintain um, the Greenway Steering Committee uh, in some form, and, and secondly, to maintain a, a Greenway officer in some form. I think that they've done a good job of um, explaining what those things are without being wedded to any particular name or form, um, and they're open to change as needed as the project changes. But um, I think in principle, we need to, to continue to support those two crucial um, uh, components of the project and um, I'm, I'm, I'm asking for all councillors support on that. Now I think um, the, the council officer's comment in relation to uh, this item is very helpful. I think it's um, good to see that there is a Greenway engagement officer that really um, might be able to fulfill what the Greenway Steering Committee um, is asking for. I think we need to um, liaise with them further on that. And, um, you know, in, in relation to the very small issue of whether they will provide administrative support to the committee, um, I, don't, I don't propose it to council now and get into business of um, writing a position description for that role. But I do think that, um, I think we do need to support the committee to do its very, very important work because it's such a huge value add for council. Um, we can't just um, uh, expect the volunteers on that committee to do um, all of the work. Uh, they provide so much more. Just, 
Just a point of order, has there been a second to this motion? I'll second. No, no there hasn't as yet, Councillor Passis, but Councillor Lockie's just indicated her willingness to. So look, I look forward to receiving um, uh, some further information on this um, uh, before the budget, if there are any budgetary implications, but uh, gladly it looks like there might not be. Um, and all we need to do is fill our position. Thanks. Thanks very much. Councillor Lockie, do you wish to speak to the item? Oh, I'm happy to wave. I think Councillor Kiat's got I'll it. Sorry, Councillor Passis, I'll come to you momentarily. Um, Councillor uh, Kiat, can I just put a question to you? Um, I, I'm in strong support. I thank you for the motion, and I'm in strong support of re-establishing what has been a, a very effective committee, and I'm um, a little perplexed as to how it came to be that the... Um, that it, it, the meetings weren't continuing to be convened. The council officers have provided advice that there are a number of staff already employed to be dedicated to this project, including an engagement officer. And they've indicated in their comments that the engagement officer could provide the support. So uh, support to ensure that the committee can function. When in point two, you refer to receiving a report outlining um, options for the committee and a dedicated Greenway officer. Are you intending that we would employ an additional officer so there would be two people providing that administrative support or are you um, uh, indicating the same general direction as the officer's comment that you'd like for that engagement officer to provide um, that administrative support? Yeah, it seems to me that the issue of the officer is, is kind of dealt with and we need to fill the position. Um, and uh, over time, we'll see uh, whether that's fulfilling the function that the steering committee is asking for. Um, but as I said, you know, they, they seem to be not too wedded to a particular form or name. But um, yeah, so I, I think that should be sufficient. And but I do want to know what the officer's views are and, and what discussions they have with the, the steering committee as to its form. Okay. So can I, just one further question, I'm not seeking to be obstructionist, but why is it a budgetary consideration if, if you're in agreement that the engagement officer could provide the support and there's no need for an additional person to be employed? Or to put it another way, why are we receiving another report? Why aren't we just directing that the engagement officer provide that support? But why does it need to be considered in the context of the budget? Yeah, well, gladly, I don't think that it does. I mean, I've drafted this before. I've realised there was this unfilled position. Okay. Does that mean that point two is redundant? Well, no, I mean, I would like to have the response from council to the, uh, the, the broad issues raised in the letter about the form of the steering committee. Um, yeah. Okay, no problem. That's fine. I'm happy to support it. Thanks for answering the questions. Is there anyone who wishes to propose yes. an amendment or a foreshadowed motion? No, I'd like to speak. I'd, yep. I'd Can, like to. Yes, Councillor Passes, I, of course I'll come to you to speak. You speak at every meeting more often than everybody else. So there's no need to interject for me to come to you. I'm, Excuse I'm me, Mr. To. Mayor, I asked to speak and then you spoke. No, Councillor Passes, you interject in almost every item before I'm able act actually to ensure that everybody gets to speak. You never miss out on speaking. You speak Mr. more than Mayor, any other councillor. Is, is, is that against the Act, speaking no, more of course than not. any other councillor? No, of course not. No, and of course we all benefit from your wisdom, so it's a, it's a benefit to us to have you speak, but I'm just pointing out that you've never been prevented from speaking. Please May proceed. May I speak? Please proceed. Well, why did you do all that? Please proceed, Councillor Passis. Is the members of the steering committee are paid? Are they paid? No. The, the members on the steering committee is not a paid committee? No. So we're looking to put another officer on, a paid officer, when we, our staff are quite capable of doing this? No, I think that question has been addressed by Councillor Kiat and his motion is for a report on how the, how the committee would be constituted. So he wants the committee to continue but what are we to, why, do, why is a budget involved in this? Well, Councillor Passis, we've just covered that ground. I've asked specific questions about it. Councillor Kiat's answered the questions. Well, I'm, I'm still not, in the I'm dark. Not put them, I'm not going to put them to him a second time. 
Okay, there's no further contributions. I'll put the Kiat Locky motion. All those in favour, please raise your hands. I presume that is unanimous. Is there anyone against? I'm against. Councillor Passis is against. The motion has been carried. Next item, Councillor Passis, traffic assessment around Ashfield Pool. Well, just a second, where have I got the motion? Yes. Now, this is a very serious issue and I'm quite upset with the um, uh, the amount, $20,000. Um, I would like that to sent around to all councillors how uh, we reach that amount for the study. Um, I would like our staff, I think our staff could do this study. If they don't think they're capable, then we'd look at calling somebody else in, an independent traffic uh, consultant. This is a major issue. This issue, and it has nothing to do with Frederick Street. There were problems there before this project went ahead. And I recalled in the old Asheville Council, the report we got on a $14 million project, the traffic report was absolutely dismal. And I raised it at the time. I said, this traffic report does not take into consideration the problems. And that was for a much smaller project. Now, I cannot go into the litany of problems that are down there. And I think 80% of the problems can be addressed in-house. The way the configuration of the car parks, the problems with the buses, um, the problems with residents that have been parked out of their own streets. What is happening in that area is just the horror stories that I have got back from residents on this, uh, no one would believe them. I have the emails, their telephone calls. They are, I put a leaflet out in the immediate area and what I was told and how they were treated by council is absolutely shocking. They, they were told that as soon as the pool opens, they're going to have a public meeting and they were going to do a traffic survey. When they've contacted to ask about when that's happening, nobody has got back to them. They've been advised to paint lines and widen their driveways at their own expense, or they've been ignored. We are well aware the council staff that work at the pool are not permitted to park in the car park. Hence the problems around the area. We know that Frederick Street, Street has been a problem for years. It was raised in the old council I have copies here from the local papers from the state uh, <coughs> member previous and present. That was that taken into consideration when we did the traffic study for the um, the project that we have now. The parking bays in the car parks are too small. They don't comply. People have to do six point turns. So putting aside the, the officer's comments about uh, the, the cost of an independent study, in the first instance, you seem to be saying in, in speaking to the motion that you would be happy for there to be in the first instance, an assessment by council traffic engineers through the traffic committee, is that correct? At, in the first instance, yes. And then we have to follow up yep, no, what, no, the RMS, what the RMS is going to do about Frederick Street. No. I think all the residents need no, no. to be... Sorry, Councillor Passes. Sorry, just a moment. So uh, on, on the basis that the motion would be amended that uh, to read that as a matter of urgency, given the major impact the new Asheville pool is having on traffic, parking and safety, that uh, this be referred to the Traffic Committee um, and a report prepared for the May 2021 Ordinary Council meeting, I would be the seconder for your motion. Are you satisfied with that? No, Mr. Mayor, May is too late. The traffic well, you've committee, nominated May. Councillors need to attend this committee. We need an on-site meeting with the traffic officers. Sorry, 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 Councillor Passes. None of that is contained in your motion, and May is the date that you've nominated. Oh no. Well, I am um, 
I'm just going on your, um, if you second my motion and you want to include that amendment. I'm finding a way around this. So I'll, we call, can I'll call the number. meeting to order. Councillor Passes, I, I'm moving an amendment that the words that a traffic and parking study be done, be deleted and replaced with um, uh, be referred to the traffic committee. Now, are you willing to incorporate that amendment or shall I move it as an amendment? I will incorporate it, but I would okay, like that's it incorporated into the primary motion. I would I'll like it as my... a matter of urgency. Yeah, uh, well, that's 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 stated in the in the motion. Um, I, I'll waive my right to speak to the motion, except to say, the Ashfield Aquatic Centre is enormously popular, and that's a great credit to all the councillors who supported its establishment. Well done. Mr. Is there Mayor, anyone who wishes to? Is there I... anyone who wishes to? Councillor Passes, I'll call you to order. Is there anyone who wishes to speak against the motion? If not, I'll put that. All those in favour? Mr Mayor, I have right of reply. No, but no one else has spoken. I have right to close. Please. Please proceed. The whole point of this is I would like a report to come to us before this study is finalised with it's all the complaints the council has received from residents. Shit. So we can also look at what needs addressing with the council officers. We need to know, not know every single resident I spoke to said that they've contacted councillors that never got back to them. They've contacted officers that never got back to them. They were promised meetings. They were promised surveys. It never happened. This cannot go away. This is urgent. It's been raised now. If anybody is injured or killed, it will be on our heads. This is one of the most serious issues in facing our municipality at this moment. So please, I want this moved on urgently. I'll put the motion, all those in favour, all those against, declare that carried unanimously. We've dealt with the Lilyfield Road motion, which brings us to item 17, print and post infringement notice. Um, Councillors, I, I won't speak at length to this. I, I'll just make a couple of points. Firstly, we are due to receive a report about parking technologies. Um, and I, I think that would be the appropriate time for us to consider whether we want to make a change to how infringement notices are issued. I, I understand that the things aren't um, automatically linked, but it's still an appropriate occasion for us to consider that matter. My, my view is I'm not quite as confident that local residents will welcome the change. Um, I, I know, and I'm sure everyone, all of the councillors will, will have had similar experiences. I know that some of, some of the most frustrated residents I've dealt with are the ones who feel that they've been issued a parking infringement notice by a ranger who was, you know, in their view, hiding behind a tree or a telegraph pole and then popped out, issued, put the, put the infringement notice on their um, windscreen and then disappeared again within a matter of seconds or in their perception because they were only, you know, inside the shop for two minutes to get bread and milk. Um, so I actually suspect, I don't have any evidence based for this other than anecdotal experience, I suspect that if we, if we change the system so that they never receive a notice and they simply receive a letter three weeks later from State Debt Recovery informing them that the Inner West Council issued them a fine um, you know, 21 days ago, uh, that, that will actually lead to a lot of frustration amongst residents, in part because in, 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 on the occurrence that... Uh, that a, an infringement notice has been wrongly issued, and we know that that's not a frequent occurrence, but it does occur. Um, if you don't receive the infringement notice at the time on your windscreen and you just receive a letter several weeks later, your ability to be able to remember where you were and then to, in an informed way, write to the council to challenge the, the decision is quite impaired. Um, it's not very easy to do that. I, I don't know about you, but I, I don't really recall where I was at any given time three or four weeks ago. I might be able to guess if I went back and looked at my, my diary and my records and so on. But I, I think the advantage of the current system is that it, it gives residents more, uh, it gives 
residents and commuters more opportunity to be able to challenge a, 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 an infringement notice that they believe has been issued incorrectly. Um, it's not something that we've consulted with the community about. I understand the officer's comments about the, the fact that this is an operational matter where we wouldn't normally automatically consult, but it has been my experience that parking is an issue that can really inflame tensions between our community and the council. And I, I think it would be wiser not to participate in the trial. I'm very happy to consider the proposal uh, at a future time when we've got a broader suite of parking technology um, proposals being brought to us for consideration. But at this time, I think it would be better not to um, initiate that trial. So I'll move that way. I'll Is second that. And can I speak? That's seconded by Councillor Passes. Of course you can speak. Too much passes is never enough. Mr Mayor, you please really don't have to um, carry on like that. I, I'm, really trying to be, I'm trying to be good-humoured and to keep the tone of the meeting as a pleasant and humorous one. Mr Mayor, we are a local council. We are representing our residents. Why don't we just get satellite? Or what are those other things called that fly around and book our people? and for scratching their backside or picking their nose. This is not a local move. You were right in everything you said. Sometimes a person will, while they're getting booked by a ranger, have one of the best excuses in the world. Somebody could have been sick. What residents would have to go to to fight an issue would be absolutely horrendous. I really do, I really have to agree with you on this. This is wrong. We are, our residents can hardly get any work done just going up to our counters anymore. It's all either email or nothing else. They don't see people. They don't talk to our council. And this is going further and further away from local and local representatives. Find, find a way of putting a satellite over the LGA and to book everybody willy-nilly, even if someone's passed out or had to stop the car and get out and be sick. Uh, this, this has to stop. A lot of, I've got a lot of complaints from residents about how we're going away from local. We're not talking to our people. People cannot submit a hard copy submission or a letter to council. They've been refused to an application for a parking permit. They have to email it. We will not accept a hard copy at the counter. This is coming up at a later date. This has to stop. A lot of our elderly residents are discriminated against and a lot of them like to go up and have a little whinge and talk to our staff on the counter. We're pushing them away and it has nothing to do with the amalgamation. We've got people behind closed doors and this is not local. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Okay, thank you for that. Further discussion, councillors? There's no further discussion. I'll waive my right of reply. I'll put the motion. All those in favour? All those against? Declare that carried unanimously. That has been carried unanimously. Uh, councillors, I think that brings us to the confidential session. So I'll move that we move into confidential session. Seconded by Councillor Macri. All those in favour? Against? Declare that carried unanimously. Catherine, could you inform us when the arrangements have been made for the meeting to proceed in private? Will do, Mayor. 